So for those who I haven't met, uh, my name's Nick Biddle, uh, Acting Director for the ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for, for coming along to the symposium uh, and welcome everyone who's uh, watching the, the recording afterwards. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people uh, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and recognise the continuous uh, ownership of uh, lands across Australia and extend that acknowledgement to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us uh, either today or, or who are watching um, the, the video. Um, so a, a couple of uh, um, apologies to, to start with. Uh, firstly, uh, I guess it's an apology and a reminder. Uh, apologies for the having to still keep wearing masks, uh, but also a reminder that when you're not eating or, or for the speakers, uh, when you're not speaking, if you can keep your mask on, uh, that would be very much uh, appreciated. Um, in a, uh, it's kind of the COVID world that we're living in. Um, uh, a couple of our speakers have been uh, either uh, directly or indirectly impacted by COVID, so we've got a little bit of a, a shuffling of, of, uh, of lineup. Um, so uh, the uh, director of the ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods, uh, Professor Matthew Gray, uh, sent his apologies, stuck in, in London, uh, trying uh, try to get, well, he might be somewhere over the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean at the moment, uh, had tried to get uh, his flights on the way back, but due to the travel uh, challenges, wasn't able to get a flight back. Uh, and also, uh, Professor Simon Jackman, uh, more directly impacted by COVID, uh, he's um, uh, in isolation up in Sydney. Um, so I'll be um, uh, uh, presenting some joint work uh, with Simon and I uh, in the later session. Um, so a few other thanks. Uh, so. Thanks to uh, Diane with Diane, uh, Diane Hertz uh, and the Social Research Centre, uh, who a long-term supporter of the centre, as well as the um, uh, Expert Data Collection Agency, who uh, not only been involved in, in collection for the um, uh, ANU poll, uh, Comparative Study Electoral Systems data, which we're going to be talking about today, uh, but also a range of other data collection which uh, we use as, as comparisons uh, as well as time series. And, and I am happy to have a chat to people uh, um, uh, during the break uh, if you want to hear a little bit more uh, about um, the SRC and the data collection and the services which they provide. Um, also, thank you to the ARC, uh, so part funding uh, for this wave of, of data collection. Uh, so the, the structure of the day, uh, so uh, we'll start with Professor Mark Kenny, I'll introduce in a second, uh, and then we've got uh, two sessions uh, where we're presenting and discussing results. Uh, so morning tea, the break uh, will be uh, between 11 and 11.30, um, so, and that will be out in the, in the foyer. Uh, another, I guess one final, uh, um, acknowledgement is that we are recording, as I mentioned, uh, so there will be plenty of time uh, for questions and discussion, um, but if there is, for whatever reason, uh, you don't want your question or, or any responses to be uh, recorded, uh, you just have to let us know and have to edit it afterwards. Uh, absolutely no problem to do so. We don't want people to feel constrained uh, by the recordings, especially seeing as we have a few kind of public servants here, but just please do let us know and we'll make sure that doesn't I get on uh, the recording. Um, uh, I think that's kind of it for the uh, kind of the housekeeping. Um, so I won't take up any more of your time for this session, uh, and I'll uh, introduce and then hand over to to Mark. Uh, I'd be very surprised if there was uh, anyone here who didn't know or know of Mark, but I'll I'll introduce Mark anyhow. Uh, so Professor Mark Kenny uh, is. Uh, from the Australian Studies Institute uh, at the ANU, uh, host of the, uh, I don't know what, uh, how you frame this, in very uh, extremely popular, uh, popular enough, uh, Democracy Sausage uh, podcast, uh, which hopefully uh, many of you have either listened to or, or after this will now uh, start listening to, um, which discusses a range of both 
uh, kind of po politics and policy uh, issues uh, and is available uh, where you get all your good podcasts, uh, including from uh, the ANU. Um, so prior co to coming to the ANU, uh, Mark was a, uh, had a long uh, and a extremely uh, prestigious journalistic career. Um, I think I got here culminating in six years as Chief Political Correspondent and National Affairs Editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, The Age and the Canberra Times. Um, so many of you would have seen Mark on ABC Insider's program, uh, but also on a range of other um, uh, media and, and still uh, writes for, um, uh, uh, contributes uh, with writing to, to a number of media outlets. Um, also, uh, Mark was a former uh, or long-time member of the, the uh, Parliamentary Press Gallery Committee and I think still is director of the National Press Club. Just stepped down. Just stepped down. Okay, there we go. Uh, and as a researcher, Mark's interests are in national politics, co comparative studies, democracy, and finally the rise of populism. Um, so, over to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah? Um, just got, I've got a couple of microphones here and I'm not entirely sure which one is doing that one. That's the one. Right. You're doing the amplifying. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Nick, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I'm not sure about uh, um, what was the term prestigious career in, in, <laughs> um, in journalism, but uh, I survived anyway. Um, I'm going. This this seminar is obviously called um, uh, realign or dealign dealignment survey perspectives on the 2022 election. Um, prior to doing that, I'm going to indulge in what I'm, I guess, better known for, which is a degree of commentary, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, so there'll be a, a strong reliance on what the survey data shows up from our fantastic speakers who are. Um, I've had a look through what they've got to say, and it's uh, really fascinating as they deconstruct uh, the, um, what happened in the election. I'm going to provide a bit of uh, commentary and perhaps a few historical uh, little, little detours in the process of doing that, which I hope you find interesting. So, among the things Anthony Albanese learned from his front row seat during the Rudd Gillard Wars was that the creation and mismanagement of expectations can stoke disunity and kill a government fast. Internal critics and rivals tend to coalesce around what you've done, what you haven't done, what you've got wrong, why you lost your nerve and disappointed your base. The damage from such things can linger over multiple terms, as we've seen within Labor and seen in, 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 not just at the federal level. This is one of the reasons Anthony Albanese remarked a number of times during the election campaign that he hoped to lead a government which under-promised and over-delivered. Expectations would remain firmly attached to the ground. This rather pedestrian aspiration of under-promising and over-delivering, as much as it was, a clear, it was clearly a dig at the Morrison government's trust deficit, its reputation for skiting, for not turning up, uh, for doing too little too late and so forth, uh, Albanese's words were also a reassurance, though, to the more engaged part of Labor's base, a kind of positive dog whistle to progressives. The coded message was that Labor's presentation, while deliberately short on big promises and bold transformative action or vision, nonetheless contained scope for reform. It was all part of a hard-nosed political calculus which comes from being in Parliament for a long time and seeing a lot of failure. Albanese had always known he would face criticism from his left flank for a perceived lack of ambition, but had concluded the task of winning from opposition was best viewed as a separate challenge from the complexities of governing, if you were lucky enough to get that far. Boiled down, his judgment had two elements. First, that centre-left voters would grumble all the way to polling day, but so what? They were hardly going to defect to the right. This informed the second part of his thinking, which was the assumption that any primary votes lost to more progressive candidates on Labor's left flank would probably wind up in Labor's column anyway through preferences. I guess you could say that one out of two ain't bad. 
It might be that the blue sky success of some banana coloured greens north of the Tweed has left some in Labor a little red faced. Colour me surprised. Successive elections will tell us which was the more important development from 2022 the extraordinary emergence of the teal independence in liberal strongholds, or well, the long foreshadowed and then largely dismissed incursion of the Greens into Labor's lower house territory. The view within Labor, funnily enough, and this was echoed amazingly by uh, a senior Howard government minister that I spoke to recently, was that in Queensland where there were no such teals, new Greens enthusiasts were the same voters who voted teal down south perhaps hoping to ex express a stronger umbrage at the Morrison government than merely voting Labor, or indeed motivated by the stronger climate action that both the Greens and the Teals seem to have in common. If Albanese's small target strategy had a measurable cost, it was in the failure to recover Ryan and Brisbane, and most astringently for Labor, the loss of Kevin Rudd's former seat of Griffith, Griffith held by the frontbencher Terry Butler. Butler was one of two Labor frontbenchers to leave the Parliament at the election. The other being, of course, Christina Keneally and Fowler, which, uh, the, the so-called parachute candidate there, which, which didn't work. Notwithstanding its historically low primary vote, which, as Nick Biddle and Ian McAllister note, is the lowest of any incoming Australian government, Albanese's small target strategy did actually work. After all, the parliamentary majority was achieved where before the election, many doubted that was possible for Labor. If there was a comparison with the Whitlam triumph, which occurred rather neatly for our purposes 50 years before, it was mostly one of contradistinction. Now, I raised Whitlam because a couple of days before the 2022 election, I wrote in the conversation that the choice confronting voters was as stark as at any time since 1972. But I also remarked in passing in that piece that were Albanese to be elected, he proposed to do less over a whole term than Whitlam had fired off in his first furious month in office. In these, if these two statements sound contradictory, they were meant to. The point was, as Mark Twain allegedly said, history doesn't repeat so much as rhyme. In 2022, the roles had quietly reversed with the effect that sticking with the status quo arguably was the bolder option in the continuity presented the more material risk to besieged governing norms, time honoured ministerial conventions, and crucially to voter confidence and trust. Given what was by then known about the Morrison government, the unaccounted for sports rorts, robo debt, the $30 million Levington Triangle purchase, the board stacking, the politicisation of the public service, the treatment of universities and the arts during the COVID crisis, the divisive culture wars and the sheer policy intransigence, what I've elsewhere called divide and dither, the passive re-election of the Morrison government would have involved an endorsement of some pretty poor governing practice. Essentially, it would have been a reward for an underperforming government adept at toughing out scandals, fanning social divisions and going missing, inclined also to attack those wanting to address climate change, corruption, underfunded aged care, and discrimination in a range of fronts, on a range of fronts. So this was the context in which Labor's platform stressed rest, restoration <coughs> and renewed accountability rather than revolution and wholesale reform. It conspicuously lacked the redistributive measures Labor had put forward previously, most pointedly in 2019. It was this contrast, this marked difference between the two sides that meant this election carried some of the historical import of 1972, its time election, even if a good deal less of the colour. In the aforementioned conversation piece, I noted in Terralia that Whitlam immediately set about establishing diplomatic relations with Peking, now Beijing of course, following his audacious trip to China, Red China as it was called then, in 1971. And it's pretty hard to imagine any opposition making a play of that kind of weight and gravity these days. Whitlam's Australian reimagining, what Stuart McIntyre called a nationalism attuned to internationalism, facilitated an economic relationship that has only helped to drive Australian economic growth since. 
but which has also insulated our trade exposed economy against all kinds of shocks like the Asian financial crisis, the GFC and most recently the pandemic. In those first days and weeks, Whitlam summarily, summarily ended military conscription and pulled Australia out of the Vietnam War, granted independence to Papua New Guinea and ratified several international conventions dealing with labour relations, uh, racial non-discrimination and nuclear weapons proliferation. Now, I'm dwelling on this because, in a sense, my jibe at contemporary labour by citing Whitlam's reformist zeal has turned out to be let's say, premature, if not just plain wrong. Tuesday, just gone, marked the first month of the Albanese Labor government, and there's actually been quite a flurry of activity. Of course, these markers, like the 100 day, you know, the first 100 days and so forth that we sometimes read about, are pretty arbitrary, but out, out of interest, recall some of the changes announced by Albanese and his ministers in that last month, in that first month. The government made a minimum wage case submission, which the Fair Work Commission, Independent Fair Work Commission, upheld, even though that had attracted the charge that uh, Anthony Albanese was a loose economic unit, you might recall, during the election. But the independent uh, umpire there has decided that 5.1% was a good idea and even went further with 5.2% for minimum wages. Uh, it immediately returned, this is the government, the Murugupan family, otherwise known as the Nadis Lingam family to Biloela, without really anything in the way of public disquiet. And it notified the UN that Australia's new climate target would be 43%, that is emissions reduction target would be 43% by 2030, rather than the previous 26 to 28%. Pretty significant things when you think about it in terms of the, the political risks to labour. Supporting an unusually high minimum wage, intervening as it were in that, even though uh, employers insisted they couldn't afford it, being soft-hearted uh, in relation to uh, a family and, and risking being seen as, uh, as, as equivocating on the tough borders stance, um, and raising the climate targets, which Morrison had always said would be economically ruinous, and of course, the previous government refused to even legislate any of, that, uh, any of its targets. Yet each was delivered with a degree of clarity and speed, and there were other decisions also struck out in the Pacific to assert Australia's primacy and economic uh, uh, weight in the region. Um, there's, and of course that's been aided by Australia's new, uh, more uh, stringent, more rigorous climate position. Uh, they've appointed a Minister for the Republic, prompting monarchists to complain that for the first time there's a Minister of the Crown dedicated to the removal of the Crown. <laughs> Um, they've begun the process of uh, having a First Nations uh, discussion and getting the Uluru statement from the heart uh, enshrined in the Constitution, or the voice particularly. They've removed the religious requirement from the school chaplains program to allow secular councils to, councillors to be employed, and they've settled the financial cost to be paid to the French Naval Group for the cancellation of the submarine program. And Albanese is uh, heading to, um, to Paris next week, as I understand, and may also be going to Ukraine. Uh, and we know, of course, that he went to, to, uh, to Japan immediately upon being elected to, to attend that Quad meeting, and there have been all kinds of, um, all kinds of other meetings in places like, for, for either Albanese or senior ministers in places like Fiji, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, and India. And of course, all of this occurred as the nation succumbed to an energy market crisis and fears of a global recession, so there's a fair bit on. Even the term stagflation has been mentioned just to keep that kind of 1975 ticking along. <laughs> Clearly, such purposeful activity seemed pretty unlikely in the campaign itself. So why was that? Well, election 2022 was a strange election in that it saw a clear exodus from the major parties towards smaller parties and independents, such that the crossbench has effectively tripled from five at the time of the 2019 election to 16 now. And upstairs in the Senate, it's actually 18. I mean, Labor only has 26 itself. Obviously, this will form part of the discussions we're about to hear today. But before we get into who voted differently from their past practice, where they did it and why, I want to paint with a broader brush the difference between the 2019 poll and the 2022 election. In deference to our scholarly detachment, I'll try and eschew the temptation to expand further on my view that Scott Morrison was the weakest and most pointless Prime Minister this country has had. Suffice it to say that when people think of ineffectual PMs, 
they automatically gravitate towards, and here's another residence with 1972, Peter McMahon. Jack Waterford wrote an obituary about McMahon in 1988 when he died, and it began like this. Australia has had few politicians who were as essentially competent, technically able, and doggedly persistent as Sir William McMahon. These qualities took him to the top, Waterford wrote. So far, this is not sounding particularly relevant to Scott Morrison, nor very favourable in terms of a head-to-head -head comparison. But Waterford's critique does come back to Morrison a bit in the second part, largely because it turns a bit more negative. He says of McMahon, once there, however, the person who spent most of his life preparing for the moment knew scarcely what to do. He could manage, even manage well, but did not have an agenda for government apart from just soldiering on. The party which put him there was losing touch and looking for new directions. Starting to sound a bit more familiar with where the government was uh, going into this election. As I say, that resonates rather more with Morrison, although in his case, voters had concluded, as we'll hear today, that Morrison himself was a large part of the reason for that drift. Worse still, from neither party nor leader was there any really obvious attempt to look for those new directions. In speaking separately with a number of leading figures on each side since the election, a couple of things have come out which, uh, over which there seemed to be common ground. Most strikingly, was agreement over the damage done to Morrison's standing by his own words, and particularly by elite SMS, SMX exchange, sorry, SMS exchanges, or what I've called testimonials, from some of those closest to him. Among these were private observations from Barnaby Joyce that Morrison was a person who, quote, routinely rearranges the truth into a lie, and from Gladys Berejiklian, who called him a horrible, horrible person, while the minister with whom she was corresponding branded him a complete psycho, or at least that's how it's been reported. I haven't seen the text myself. But it was when Emmanuel Macron called him a liar that these other pieces of evidence crystallised into deep disdain. Asked if he thought he had been lied to by the Australian Prime Minister, a furious Macron uh, famously responded, I don't think, I know. Voters don't usually worry too much about foreign affairs, much less the opinions of European leaders, but Macron's clarity suddenly cut through. It was as if the objectivity of an outsider was the final proof needed, the coup de grace. Morrison's own words, of course, I don't hold a hose, mate, and that's not my job, were also crucial, and we saw those uh, uh, reported, obviously, or, or carried a lot through the election in Labour's advertising. For political scientists and political historians, Excuse me. This trajectory raises some fascinating lines of inquiry about how impressions of leaders accrete over time and then ossify, and whether this has changed in potency and character in the digital age. I, for one, had wondered if anti Morrison sentiment amongst members of the political class was overstated because ordinary voters don't tend to carry around in their heads the details of this transgression or that, this gaffe or whatever. In the digital realm, however, every ill-chosen word, every teeny insensitivity can be accessed and many are packaged up into social media bites and memes, perfect for staying front of mind. Among female voters, both Labour and Liberal sources I spoke to said Morrison's astonishing suggestion in relation to the March for Just Justice protesters, that they should be glad they lived in a country where they could protest freely without facing bullets, was a grievous error. And that was Liberals and Labour people telling me that. But it was most surprising to me that there was a Liberal, a very senior Liberal, as I say, uh, no longer in the Parliament, uh, but who I would have expected to be a, a pretty solid uh, Morrison supporter, who raised and then expressed unrestrained contempt for Morrison's treatment of the Australia Post boss, Christine Holgate. All of these things tended to reinforce each other, I think, is the theme here. My sense, and this is the real point of the Whitlam comparison in this 50th year of the election, was that 2022 was a change of government year and that it was, for a variety of reasons, equally significant in terms of the magnitude of the choice before voters. In 72, it had been Whitlam's bold agenda of imagination firing change after 23 years of conservative rule. 
Perhaps that was what Shorten was trying to do in 2019, a big change agenda. Steeper cuts to emissions, increased taxes through tightening loopholes and concessions, increased spending in a raft of areas. And who knows, it might have worked against Malcolm Turnbull, for whom that strategy was actually devised. But it didn't. And Albanese, who had comfortably won the rank and file leadership ballot against Shorten in 2013, but lost out to the caucus half of that uh, selection process, had essentially spent that time on the outside to two, two fairly unrewarding electoral cycles, but he had learned a good deal. He knew that the election had to be a choice between a bad government and a safe alternative. And it's noteworthy that uh, Zoe Daniel and Goldstein crystallised this sentiment also with her slogan, the same isn't safe. Morrison's strength in 2019 was that few in the broader electorate really knew him, <coughs> allowing a marketing-focused approach that turned on the risks of the bill you can't afford and so on. His politically fa fatal weakness in 2022, however, after a term in government, was that voters knew him, perhaps knew him too well. Albanese understood this and took a calculated risk that he would draw as little attention to himself and to any Labor plans for change as he could reasonably get away with. Finally, can I turn to the Teals and by extension to the media, who with a few exceptions either dismissed or became hysterical about them. Much has already been said about the uniformly high quality of these candidates, the fact they were all women, in the lower house anyway, university educated and progressive. Yet the most notable thing about them actually was their community engagement and their volunteer base and the campaigns, the enthusiasm that their campaigns generated. Hardened political professionals that I spoke to even through it, through the election campaign could only look on in awe at the 2,000 or so volunteers for Monique Ryan or Zoe Daniel or any of these other uh, candidates, pointing out that there were actually more people volunteering in these relatively few teal seats than the major parties could put together with their actual <coughs> memberships. These people were obviously enthusiastic, signed on to uh, give, give their free time and, uh, and were seeking a better politics, a new way, evidence-based policy rather than blunt denialism and ideological blinkers. But many journalists couldn't seem to cope at a conceptual level with this. Ludicrous columns and editorials flooded newspapers and crusty sages banged on about the threat to stability, as if that's been serving the nation so well. Many journalists, as I oh, sorry, some observers discovered the influence of money for the first time, having stayed silent on the donations of Rio Tinto, BHP, and Santos, and even the tobacco companies. And even as their outlets raked in millions of dollars from populist mining millionaire who attempted, not for the first time, to swamp the election with vulgar advertising, suddenly it was the role of Simon Holmes Court's Climate 200 that was the major preoccupation, even as the real yarn, a community upwelling and the biggest existential threat to the Liberal Party in its 80 year history was unfolding before them. Most concerning in my assessment was the parroting of Liberal Party talking points about the claims of fake independence and then being uh, the independence actually being another party. This heinous charge was being made by, guess what, people in a political party. None of it worked. It was hyperventilating and self-interested special pleading by a group who had come to believe their party and the national interest were essentially the same thing. And that independents, citizens standing for an election in a democracy, had to be treated like imposters, evidence of dysfunction. Ed Coper, who ran what he called the Teal War Room, or digital advertising campaigns, told Maria Tafaga and I on Democracy Sausage a day or two ago that it was just noise. And the louder it got, the more it suggested that change was needed. And the more aggressive the attacks on the candidates, the more their supporters redoubled the effort, their efforts. More tellingly even than this, the attacks on the Teals was viewed by their supporters as attacks on them. John Howard, you might recall, referred to them as Labour groupies, and suggested others suggested, uh, including in ads, that they were hidden greens and so forth. And we saw the ads in this jurisdiction um, about David Pocock suggesting that he was actually a closet green and, and the like. Interestingly, Coba told us that the message that they expected to be most damaging, a message like a vote for Josh Frydenberg is a vote for Barnaby Joyce, was only the second most cut through line that they came up with, behind a vote for Josh Frydenberg is a vote for Scott Morrison. That's how negative the PM had become 
in his own seats among many lifelong Liberal voters, and of course many voters beyond that, and, many, and beyond those borders as well. Why wasn't this more prominent in the media analysis? Why wasn't the fact that the PM could not even visit his party's most treasured strongholds more clearly be interpreted as a sign the government was finished? Why was the Liberal Party losing its base while in office? Why wasn't that a bigger story? Another question, why did the Liberals persist with Morrison when that was actually going on, when he was the main drag on their boat? Now, Maria and I discussed this, and she attributes it, attributes it mostly to the rules which make changing leaders now so problematic. That's certainly part of the story, but I suggest it starts before that with the professionalisation of politics, a process which controls every aspect of messaging and employs tools to make dissent anathema, and which pretty quickly arrives at a justification for just these kinds of rule changes. Looking to the future, the questions are so intriguing. Is Labor vulnerable to Teal-style independence also, or is its challenge more likely to come from the Greens? Can the Greens present, and I think this is a really interesting uh, question to ponder, perhaps beyond, uh, beyond the, um, the remit of today, but one that we, we can think about. Can the Greens present as a mainstream party uh, such that they can hold on to lower house seats outside a change of government election environment, such as is likely to pertain in 2025. I suspect not if they are going to continue on as they've started out uh, running in this term, running on culture wars about the flag and the Uluru statement from the heart. Lower house holdings may well mean the Greens are about to learn what it's like to represent a broad community as distinct from representing an activist slice of a broad community. The Liberals face an equally obvious threat. Would independents tend to consolidate and these look to be good independents. Peter Dutton already seems to have conceded this point of this flag contesting Labor in the regions and the outer suburbs. But the question here is how does he get to 76 seats without recovering some or all of these tier electorates? And how does he fund it? The money raised in places like Kuyong has been used more broadly for the Liberal Party uh, and uh, losing those seats must be a real blow to, uh, to their chances there. If the plan is to seriously contest these seats, where will they get the candidates to outperform these new teams? Presumably they'd have to be women, and they'd also have to be sufficiently different to warrant change. What issues do they run on? Andrew Constance, the Liberal unsuccessful candidate in Gilmore, has reported in the Herald this very morning as wanting a philosophical re re reawakening. To quote him, the party can't exist for itself it's got to exist for the community. It's got to reflect community values and community thinking. Politics can't continue as a dog-eat-dog -dog world because it isn't resulting in good outcomes for our community. And more specifically on climate change after the Black Summer bushfires, which of course affected the electorate he was standing for, Gilmore. He says a lot of communities have been belted by these major climatic events. They are the ones that want the world to change the most. They are wanting to see response from government which is different from funding fire stations or fire trucks, but actually looking at the way in which we can shift the landscape. While Morrison's hand-picked candidate in Moringa, Catherine Deves, was railing against transgender kids playing sport, and the travelling press pack was playing games with the opposition leader on the, on the campaign trail, Australian voters were quietly on the move, concerned about much bigger things. Election 2022 gave expression to this in multiple ways. Thank you. Uh, can do My throat just questions. made it. <laughs> I have no. If you want to do questions <coughs> with all four of us, so we'll speak and then we'll do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Because you'll have a chance to ask questions 
uh, and that might be uh, easier for the person who's going to have to take around the microphone and so on. Basically, uh, with the session this morning, we've got three speakers. Uh, we're going to have Nick, who, as, we, uh, as he mentioned, uh, is uh, doing this with Simon Jackman, who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. Uh, and uh, Nick, as he said, is the, currently the acting director of the ANU Centre for Social Research. Uh, and in his day job, he also uh, is the lead researcher for the policy experiments lab at the Centre for Social Research and Methods. Uh, he's got the usual plethora of degrees that academics uh, bring. Uh, and his PhD thesis was on the benefits of and participation in education of Indigenous Australians. Uh, so he comes with his economics background, his social policy background, and since being in CSRM has taken over the, what are called the ANU polls, which I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, and some of you will have used, and they are, by the way, publicly available in the Australian Data Archive. Uh, for people who might want to access the actual data. Uh, and he's got, a, has, as a result of that, has extended his interest into political science as well. Um, and he's had a background in the Australian Bureau of Statistics, so it's very strong on methodology, which I think you'll see a bit of in his presentation uh, and so on. He's also a fellow of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute. So he's going to talk first. We're then going to be followed by uh, Sarah Cameron, who's from the University of uh, Sydney, and she also uh, has just, uh, is this her last day at the University of Sydney? Uh, and then she's taking up a tenured position uh, at uh, Griffith University, so that's fantastic. And she is uh, a graduate uh, here uh, of the ANU with her PhD, uh, having been completed here. And she's got research interests in comparative political behaviour, Australian politics, citizens' responses to crises. Uh, she's also a chief investigator on the Australian election study. And today we're not looking at the Australian election study, we're looking at the ANU polls and what's called the CSES, the Comparative Studies uh, Surveys, Studies of Election Surveys. Um, and that's a big international uh, uh, group who run this uh, survey at all elections in a whole range of countries. Um, and then she's going to be followed by Interfar Chowdhury, who's also uh, from the School of Politics and International Relations here, uh, and is a PhD candidate there. And some of you who watched Q&A um, a few weeks ago will have seen Inti in fine form uh, there. Um, she's working on uh, the large comparative databases that are uh, available on, on surveys of democracies, and her interest is in young people. Uh, and, and their voting. She also uh, has a, a, a day job as well, uh, and that is uh, working at the ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods in the Australian Data Archive that I mentioned. Now I'm chairing, and I'm known for being pretty tough, uh, and so they've all got 12 minutes to talk. Uh, I'm gonna put my hand up at five, then three, and then one, and then I'm gonna cut them off, regardless of what they're in the middle of. Uh, because I want all of you to have an opportunity to ask questions and to have you know, an engaged uh, debate about uh, all of the issues that this election uh, has highlighted and which Mark has given a wonderful uh, introduction to the kind of history and, uh, and, and all of the complexity, actually, that seems to be emerging from thinking it was all going to be very conservative and so on. Really, it's now looking very interesting. Uh, and so on. So those are going to be the three speakers and Nick is going to start off first. Uh, thanks and uh, I think Tony neglected to introduce yourself. So uh, Tony Lukai, former uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences, Sciences uh, and so thanks for that introduction Tony. So um, you're stuck with me twice actually so I'm, I'm bookending this uh, not by choice. Um, so I'm going to start off with by introducing the, the surveys uh, and talking uh, about the election results with a particular focus on kind of short-term change uh, and also a tiny bit of data from post, uh, people's views post-election. Uh, and this paper is, is co-authored with Ian uh, and, and it's available on the Andy Center for Social Research and Methods website. Uh, then at the end, the last, uh, presenter is the, the last presentation sorry, is the one with uh, uh, Simon, 
Uh, and he sent his apologies as mentioned due to his COVID uh, uh, diagnosis. Um, so Marx introduced uh, a, a range of, um, I guess, it, it asked a range of questions uh, around, uh, and I just got a few notes here of what he said, you know, community engagement uh, as one of the, the measures um, or, or the differences between the Teal candidates and some other candidates. Uh, no public disquiet post-election. Uh, uh, Greens mainstream uh, and uh, anti-Morrison sentiment overstated. Uh, that was a question, uh, not, a, not a statement. Uh, and whether that was uh, going to be borne out in the data. Um, all of those obviously have uh, their empirical questions. Uh, we, uh, there's some evidence for those uh, in the uh, election results themselves, accounts uh, from the Australian Election, election Committee, um, Commission, sorry, but uh, they are mostly answerable uh, using survey data. Uh, as Tony mentioned, uh, the ANU, uh, and led by Ian McAllister and, and many others, uh, are in the, in the field at the moment for the Australian Election Study, which is a long-standing uh, set of surveys asking these questions. Uh, so uh, stick around, not today, but stick around in the, in the medium term uh, to see the results from that survey, which will be able to put the 2022 survey in a much longer time series. Um, so what we're talking about today, though, is a combination ANU poll uh, comparative study of electoral systems. Uh, so essentially, this data collection, uh, and I mentioned the uh, collaboration with uh, the Social Research Centre, uh, Diane Hertz. Uh, this survey was undertaken on the Life in Australia panel, uh, Australia's only <coughs> probability-based uh, online panel. Uh, what that means is that Australians, uh, adult Australians, have been recruited to their panel uh, via either their landline or their mobile phone, uh, and invited to participate uh, as uh, survey respondents over a long period of time. Uh, so e extensive uh, population coverage, um, uh, all uh, adult Australians, uh, and includes those with both fixed and mobile, um, who, are, who can be contacted by fixed and mobile phones. Uh, unlike other surveys uh, where people opt in, uh, people are recruited, uh, which allows us to get uh, to better able to benchmark uh, against the, the national um, uh, national population. Although, as I'll show in a second, that's still not easy. It's still challenging uh, in a world of survey research. Uh, another thing which distinguishes uh, ANU poll uh, and Life in Australia study, uh, sorry, panel, uh, is that participants are able to uh, complete either over the phone. Uh, or uh, um, the vast majority who do it online. Uh, and what that allows us to do is, is get the, the opinions, the views, the attitudes, the behaviours uh, of people who might not be able to engage uh, with uh, online data collection. Uh, as well as, on the flip side, uh, those who, uh, because of their, uh, their lives, the challenges, uh, are, are unable to find time to complete a survey uh, over the phone. So we have that mix of people who are both online and offline. There's incentives to participate uh, and uh, incentives to be on the panel. Um, so what you're going to hear most about today uh, is the May 2022 survey. Uh, so data, collect data collection commenced on the 23rd of May. Uh, so uh, I think uh, many political staffers and others in, in political parties will have still have been nursing hangovers, uh, depending uh, whether they were Labor uh, Liberal or, or Greens, depending, will influence the reason for that hangover. Uh, but our survey participants uh, were already uh, giving us their views uh, and responses to the election uh, two days afterwards, while the um, the vote was still still being counted. Um, so the main data collection. Uh, so we did a pilot on the Monday, and then the main data collection started on the the 24th of May, the Tuesday, and continued on to the 5th of, of June. Uh, so we ended up with a little over three and a half thousand uh, respondents, uh, and most of those uh, completed the survey in the first three days, so the 24th, 25th, and 26th of May. Um, 
So of those who are invited to participate, uh, we got a, uh, well, the SRC got a, a completion rate of 82%. But when you take into account recruitment to the panel, uh, much lower, and that's because it's very hard, obviously, to get people onto a panel. Once they're on there, though, we're able to maintain and, 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 and have that balance uh, across the population. Importantly for us, though, uh, of those uh, who had completed the May survey, uh, almost 95%, uh, 93.5% had completed the April 2022 survey. So this is uh, a comparison of the data. Uh, so we asked essentially uh, three, uh, or we have three voting questions. Uh, we have others obviously, we asked about Senate vote, but these are the three main ones which we'll be using. Uh, so uh, in May people were asked, uh, in the federal election on the 21st of May in the House of Representatives, which party did you vote for? Uh, they were also asked uh, in the last federal election uh, between Scott Morrison and, and Bill Shorten, uh, who got your first preference uh, in the House of Representatives election? Uh, in April 2022, which our survey commenced the day after the election uh, campaign commenced, um, so quite timely again, uh, we asked if a federal election for the House of Representatives was held today, uh, which of the following uh, parties would you vote for? Uh, and as you can see, for our, uh, our survey uh, is underrepresented uh, in terms of the coalition, uh, overrepresented in terms of Labor and the Greens. And therefore, in our data, we need to adjust uh, and take into account those differences as best we can, uh, and certainly making as many of our statements conditional on, on who someone voted for, uh, and also uh, making sure that where we can, uh, we're focusing on kind of our longitudinal uh, uh, insights and our longitudinal data set. So despite all the effort we've gone into to, to get a balance panel, they're still not completely perfect, uh, but still close enough, I think, to, to give us a really good insight of the views <coughs> of uh, the voting public uh, immediately after the election. Um, so what are the, some of the things we found? Uh, so this is essentially a, a, a really quick summary uh, of the paper which Ian and I put, Ian and I put out on, on Monday, uh, which tries to explain uh, the vote, uh, who changed their vote, uh, as well as uh, a few other issues like uh, who voted differently in the House of Representatives uh, compared to the Senate, uh, as well as uh, kind of other attitudes and behaviours. Um, so we've essentially identified kind of types uh, based on our analysis of um, uh, people's May 20, we've started here with our, our 2022 vote, uh, of the four main groupings. Now in Ian's presentation, he's gonna break that other group down uh, into the teals and the rest, uh, but to start with, we're just focusing on, on the coalition uh, Labour, Greens, and other. So, coalition voters uh, tend to be older, uh, non-Indigenous, uh, low levels of education, uh, living outside of cap uh, uh, capital cities, and household income outside the bottom part of the income quintile. So, the, one of the interesting narratives was that uh, the Labour Party and, and, and to a lesser extent the Greens uh, have kind of lost the, the, the lower part of the, the working class lower part of the income distribution. That's certainly not uh, evidence in our data, and especially when you are kind of conditional um, on, on education, uh, those with relatively low levels of education are still less likely to vote for the coalition. Uh, key trends for, or key predictors for labor, uh, high levels of education and living, outside, living in capital cities. Uh, Greens voters tend to be female, and, and Sarah will talk about this uh, young, Inti will talk about that. Uh, born in Australia uh, and without a trade qualification. And I think the interesting uh, difference, and there's much variation within, uh, is those who voted for another party tended to have high levels of education, uh, lived outside of a capital city, and had a relatively low household income. And that really highlights that difference between the Teals and others uh, in that other, um, others in the other uh, groupings. Uh, what happened during the election campaign? Uh, well, there was some quite interesting, uh, so essentially this is a comparison of how someone voted, uh, so how someone said they would vote when asked in April 2022, uh, and how they ended up voting uh, afterwards. Uh, and the biggest flow is between Labor and the Greens, uh, and then in aggregate also from uh, the Coalition and Labor to other parties. 
so over the election, remember these are the same people. Uh, so there's no change in, in, in composition of our survey. These are exactly the same people who they said they would vote for in April compared to who they ended up voting for. So flows, net flows from coalition to Labour, uh, but large, uh, the largest flows going from Labour uh, to the Greens. Um, just one uh, final point before I get on to the post-election satisfaction, uh, and this is in, in response to, to Mark's point. Uh, why did people change their vote? Uh, well, uh, the main reason people gave is because their views on their local candidate changed. Uh, so it was not national issues, it was views on their local candidate. Now for some coalition uh, candidates, well they didn't even know who they were uh, leading into the election, uh, but uh, it really does reflect that for this uh, election in particular, there was a real local flavour, and who uh, was in that, who was running for that particular electorate, really mattered. And just final point uh, in, in response to to Mark's uh, point about uh, no public disquiet, uh, well, certainly that's our evidence as well. Um, so in our May survey, uh, we asked whether uh, people's views about living in Australia, uh, whether they were dissatisfied or satisfied with the direction of the country, uh, and a very large increase. Once again, this is for the same respondents. Uh, large increase between April uh, and May uh, in proportion of Australians who were satisfied with the direction of the country. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, coalition voters became less satisfied, but the improvement in satisfaction for the rest far outweighed that decline for the coalition. So, uh, just to set us up, uh, probability panel, uh, but some different results to the AEC estimates, and therefore our focus really is on relativities and attitudes. Um, some key demographic factors, uh, and are these trends or one-offs due to the nature of the election? Uh, the flows were quite similar to the 2019 election in terms of aggregate, but the nature of those flows were quite different. And finally, uh, short-term uh, lack of disquiet, uh, whether that's long-term or not, we'll have to see uh, over our next uh, surveys. Thanks. Thank you very much. Sarah is going to talk next. Thanks very much uh, to the Centre for Social Research and Methods for putting on this event. And thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking briefly on gender, voting and representation in the, <clears throat> in the 2022 Australian federal election. And this will uh, draw upon uh, the data from the survey uh, that Mick just introduced, the comparative study of electoral systems. And some of this will be combined with earlier data from the Australian election study to situate this election in longer term perspective. So the Liberal Party has long been perceived as having a problem with women. This is partly due to women's relative underrepresentation uh, in Parliament within the Liberal Party and more broadly being perceived as being an unfriendly environment for women politicians. And then what has happened in the past 18 months or so is that gender equality issues and gender equality in politics in particular has become especially salient. And there's a number of factors that have contributed to this, including Grace Tame being awarded Australian of the Year, uh, Brittany Higgins allegations and the national conversation that that started including um, major protests on gender equality issues. Also uh, Scott Morrison in particular was, was criticised and we've seen plenty of these images of Scott Morrison with his back turned uh, while, while Tammy Plibersek is speaking in Parliament. And then in the 2022 campaign, there was of course the rise of uh, the Teal Independents, most of whom were professional women targeting 
previously safe Liberal seats. So gender equality has been particularly salient as an issue in this election. And what we can look at using the comparative study of electoral systems data is the gender breakdown in voting. And in a moment, I'll place this in perspective uh, relative to previous <coughs> uh, gender patterns in terms of voting. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we see here uh, some, some small differences. Slightly more men than women voted for the Liberal Party, a gap of about three percentage points. There's essentially no gap. Uh, in the proportion of men and women that voted for the Labor Party. And then the biggest gap we see is in voting for the Greens, where about 5% more women than uh, men voted for the Greens. And we can place this in longer term perspective, uh, using data from the Australian election study. So. Back in the 1990s, women were slightly more likely than men to vote Liberal and men were slightly more likely than women to vote Labor. And what we've seen over time is a reversal of this traditional gender voting gap, whereby women are now a bit more likely to vote for parties on the left uh, and men are more likely to vote for parties on the right. And that's something that we see not just in Australia, uh, but also in other advanced democracies around the world. And in the Australian context, the biggest gender voting gap uh, was in 2016 and 2019, where 10 per cent more men than women voted for the Liberal Party. And in this election, the gender gap seems to have narrowed. Uh, so, and that's not because uh, the Liberal Party has gained support among women, but because they've lost a lot of support among uh, both men and women. And there are a number of uh, factors that have contributed to this long-term reversal in the gender gap in voter behaviour. This includes changes in the electorate over the past few decades, as well as changes in the political parties. So in terms of electorate changes, we've seen over the past few decades, women's increased labor force participation, as well as uh, women's increased uh, rates of higher education. Cross-national studies have also shown a generational change is a factor. Among older generations, men tend to be further to the left, whereas among younger generations, women are further to the left. Uh, and also, over the past few decades, we've seen a decline of religiosity. But we've also seen changes in the major political parties over the past few decades, most notably uh, the transformation of women's representation in the Labor Party, um, but not so much within the Liberal Party. Back in the 1990s, women were similarly underrepresented in both major parties, as highlighted in a study by uh, Katrine Beauregard, who's based here at ANU. And then through a voluntary party quota within Labor, we've seen a dramatic increase in the proportion of uh, women in Parliament within Labor, um, but progress has been a lot slower within the Liberal Party. The Comparative Study of Electoral Systems Survey also includes a few questions on people's attitudes towards... Sorry, I missed that thing. <laughs> gender breakdown in Parliament, uh, in the House of Representatives, before and after uh, this most recent election. So previously in the House of Representatives uh, it was 31% female. After this election 
it is up to 38%. So we've seen an increase in women's representation in the House of Representatives. And we can see here how this is broken up uh, across the different parties. So women were underrepresented in uh, the coalition already, and after the election, uh, they're down to just 11 women in the House of Representatives um, from 15 before the election. Labor has gotten closer to gender equality in terms of uh, their members of parliament. And then the big shift that we see is this increase in other women, which is the rise of the teal independence. And the survey asks a, a series of questions about people's attitudes towards women uh, and their representation in parliament. And so we can look at this data, including how it is broken up by gender. So <clears throat> just over 50% overall uh, believe that the current percentage of women in parliament is, is too low. A tiny minority of both men and women uh, think that the proportion of women in parliament is too high. But we do see some uh, gender differences here. The most frequently occurring response uh, for men is that the current level is about right. Um, whereas for women, 61% believe that the current women's representation is too low. Another question is asked about people's attitudes towards policies to increase the representation uh, of women in Parliament and whether they have gone too far and ask whether people agree or disagree with this statement. And it's a minority that agree, although we see a gender difference here. So it's uh, under 30% of men that agree with this uh, and just 16% of women that agree. And then we see a majority of women uh, disagreeing compared to uh, just over 40% for men. So to sum up, in terms of the data that we have so far, the voting pattern that we see in 2022 is that there's a, there was a slight advantage for the Liberals among men, no difference based on gender uh, in voting for Labor, and the biggest difference was seen in voting for the Greens, where about 5% more women than men voted for the Greens. We see the persistence of this modern gender voting gap, whereby more women are voting for parties on the left, while more men are voting for parties on the right. But the gender gap has actually narrowed from its widest point in 2019. And as has been highlighted by uh, the analyses by uh, Nick and, and Ian McAllister, gender is not the biggest socio-demographic factor influencing the vote. And of course, it's important to recognise that women are a heterogeneous uh, group. There's a lot of diversity within women and within men. Nevertheless, gender issues were highly salient in this election and particularly influential in the rise of the Teal independence, which has transformed uh, the Australian Parliament. And our data shows that there's a good degree of public support for greater women's representation in Parliament. Uh, so thank you very much, and I look forward to discussing further. Sort of zoom into one particular demographic which has had 
uh, a significant effect on, on the 2022 um, um, federal election outcomes. Now, with uh, young people largely moving away from, from the two major parties, uh, the youth vote played a crucial role in, in, the, in the May vote. And um, younger, pe younger people, younger voters, more concerned about inadequate action on climate change and the, and the um, rising um, intergenerational inequality compared to older voters, were more likely to favor progressive parties such as the Greens Party. Um, and as a more educated younger generation replaces older voters uh, in the electorate, I argue that, uh, and, and obviously recent election um, results as well as survey data shows, uh, that policy voting compared to partisan voting might become the norm in Australia. Now, in line with the realignment and the dealignment debate um, uh, today, I divided my talk into three parts. First, I'll briefly gloss over what actually happened in the 2022 federal election uh, to then uh, put the youth vote into context. And um, after that, I will talk about how young people voted using the A new poll, the freshly out A new poll results, and put it uh, against um, uh, a Australian election study results as well as the Australian Electoral Commission results, which kind of sings the same song about the importance of the youth vote. And then lastly, I will uh, talk about what this might really mean, what the youth uh, vote might mean electorally going forward. Now, what actually happened? So very briefly, the 2022 electro, um, federal election saw a significant move away from the two major parties with a host of independents and green, greens candidates taking seats away uh, from the two major parties. And amid predictions of, uh, about a youth quake, which really refers to youth action to a point that makes um, um, a noticeable amount of political shift, um, what role did uh, young people or younger voters really play in this radical electoral shift? And how important could this role be in the, in the upcoming elections? Uh, now, leading up to the election, there was a lot of speculation about young people's um, voting behaviour, particularly as other advanced democracies uh, records a worrying decline in youth electoral participation. Um, I, in a paper last year, showed that young Australians are quite different, perhaps because of the compulsory voting uh, culture, the political culture instilled by compulsory voting. Still, there were concerns that against a backdrop of um, COVID sufferings, economic uh, inequality, climate inaction, and obviously decaying trust in political leaders, uh, this would culminate into um, youth political disengagement. Clearly, that did not happen. Now, um, if we divide the Australian electorate into three age groups, the youngest, say, from 18 to 34, which captures both first-time voters, uh, the youngest being 18, 19, etc., uh, as well as um, older people from younger generations. So we still largely talk about millennials being a young generation. However, the oldest uh, millennials are 42. Uh, it's hard to believe, but it, they are. So 34 sure. really captures this sense of, of that, um, that young generation as well. Um, results from the ANU poll, which was conducted in April, which asked people, who would you vote for if the elections were held today? It shows that older people were more likely to vote uh, for coalition, whereas younger people favored progressive parties more compared to other age groups. Obviously, if you recall Nick's pretty flow graph, um, the April um, um, survey actually underrepresents um, the support for Greens as well as others. So actually, in fact, what happened in May is people who said that there was a, a significant amount of people who said that they would be voting for the two major parties, but ended up voting for um, the Greens and um, um, Independents. We also know that uh, from the Australian election study that Greens vote has been increase, increasing in the youngest age group across time, meaning this wasn't very surprising. Speaking of the Australian election studies, if we look into the long-term voting trends and place this against this year's uh, results, um, from what we see, we've seen in the previous slides, uh, we can see that, well, 
So here I've got from 1987 to 2019 results from the post-election study, so it's an election study, and uh, I've divided in two age groups, um, 18 to 34 and 55 and over. Would like to cite uh, the AES Trends file put together by Ian McAllister and Sarah Cameron. And what I did is put uh, little dots next and similar colored dots uh, representing um, the parties or other candidates. Uh, we can see that um, for the youngest age group, so being 18 to 34, um, there has been a significant increase in, in um, the Greens for its share, whereas uh, major parties have been losing their youth for it to, um, to Greens and other, others as well. Um, notable also on the right hand side is that there has been a slight increase in um, Greens vote among the old age group as well um, and also other candidates have been um, getting a sl slight increase of support among older um, voters as well. Now again if we look at uh, results from the Australian Electoral Commission um, Commission's enrollment data it's not surprising that electorates with the highest rate of voters under 30 saw an unprecedented support for Greens in 2022. And uh, the seats with the top four, uh, well, top four seats of the top five highest proportion of young, young voters being 18 to 29 in their analysis went to Greens. Uh, and these are Melbourne, Brisbane, Griffith and Ryan. Um, so what did uh, young people actually care about? What did actually people care about? I do apologize for the text bleeding over, it looks all right here, but I don't know why it's doing that, so I hope you can read. The second line actually reads results from ANU poll 2022. Um, so if we look into um, what the three age groups really cared about, on the left hand side I've got uh, the issue with the highest priority, and on the right hand side issue with the lowest priority. There are bits in the middle as well. There were 22 po um, policy options that we issues options that uh, respondents could tick from. I have put uh, the top five in the, in the bottom five. So we can see that young um, among young people the top issues were reducing the cost of living, not surprising at all, dealing with global climate change, improving the educational system obviously, reducing healthcare costs, fixing the aged care system, passing you other grandparents, all of which coalition did poorly in, as we know. We also know that younger voters were more concerned about environmental issues of so that little uh, globe with the green leaves coming up, which only appears among the youngest age group, which is again not surprising. Now, none of these issues were adequately addressed during the last term of the parliament, which was marred by threatening bushfires, um, uh, heat waves and floods, and saw uh, inadequate action on climate change and obviously rising intergenerational inequality. Um, think about property prices. So mostly Australians are concerned about, like all Australians are concerned about reducing the cost of living, fixing the aged care system and reducing health care costs. All Australians are least concerned about, now if we look into the right hand side, about strength, strengthening the military, dealing with the issue of immigration and reducing budget deficit, all traditional, which, traditionally which more or less fall in, into the realms of the coalition. There is obviously, as, as a side note, there is some evidence of uh, period effects. So last year in a paper I argued that I found uh, from an AES, and from AES long-term analysis, that for all Australians, electoral decisions are impacted um, significantly by the events of the period of the election. This time around, it was cost, cost of living was, uh, was a very big issue which uh, swayed many people's uh, votes. Um, now, what does this mean? The election shows uh, that um, the center of gravity, perhaps, of Australian politics has shifted. Um, the various swings away from the major parties revealed how discerning um, voters can be. It also showed that uh, voters are likely to act based on pol policy concerns rather than uh, political allegiances. Now, um, there has been an increase in the number of younger generations. Um, speaking of millennials, 42, uh, oldest millennial being 42 at the moment, 
Um, as they tend to, uh, uh, this, these trends can be uh, attributed to generational replacement as the poles populate with more progressive, um, also uh, a partisan younger voters. And this trend is only going to increase. Now, a basic analysis of current enrollments um, plus expected future enrollments suggests that by next election, millennial voters and, um, and even younger, um, those under 45 will make up uh, about 44% of the population. Now, this is um, the electorate, I mean. Now, this is similar to the election this year um, where they made up to 43%. However, this is a significant uh, increase up from 10 or 20 years ago, meaning uh, what we consider to be younger generations are replacing their older counterparts and their more conservative values over, over time in the electorate. This also means that major parties uh, are a lot of the moment, so, so are other parties such as Greens, um, and if the Labour Party as well as Greens candidate hope to uh, retain their seats, it's very important to um, look into issues at, at, at um, you know, the communal issues, what people are thinking about. Uh, as Mark rightly said, that expectations need to be firmly attached uh, to the ground. Now, um, this also means that the Greens and Teals are perhaps won by the virtue of issue-based voters who will be watching uh, uh, as to what they're delivering um, as uh, the Australian um, electorate shifts or moves away from partisan voting um, into policy or issue-based voting. Thank you. recruitment to the panel. Uh, so there's a pretty low proportion of people who, when they're asked, say they'll be on a panel. Uh, but, and then, when you combine that with... So a lot of people say they don't want to be on the panel. That's correct. What, that's what yes. you really say. Yes, exactly. But when you're on the panel, you have a very high response rate. Okay, yep. that's, that, now, now I understand it. Yep. The second one was on the next next one, slide. Yep. You know, on the education, no, the education one. I don't understand why people who completed Year 12 and people who didn't complete Year 12, why don't they add up? Uh, okay, so that's essentially the, it's not, um, you sum up within those groups uh, rather than, uh, so 29.3 plus 36.6 plus 21 plus 13 should add up to 100. Uh, and so it's essentially saying 29% of those who had completed your 12 voted for the coalition, uh, compared to 47% of those who not completed your 12 who voted for Labor. So it doesn't tell me yes. quite what I thought it was telling me, which was that people who have got year 12, uh, sorry, the, 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 the So essentially what it's saying is that if you, uh, that there's a big difference by education, uh, essentially relatively low educated and more likely to vote for the coalition, uh, those with relatively high levels of education are more likely to vote for Greens okay. and Labor. I, I was yeah. trying to wait a month. Yeah, 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 so yeah, that's right. up within, not across. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. So, do you want to a few, give that to the panel, and then we've got another one. And so, Marion, I think, has had a hand up. Yeah. Sorry, we'll, we might have to pass it back if that's okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Labor did not have women's policy or LGBTIQ 
policy branches in this election, unlike previous federal elections, uh, they relied in terms of women's policy on campaigning on the care economy. Uh, the Greens were much more forthright, both on women's, their women's policy and LGBTIQ. Do you think that contributed to that um, gender gap? Quite possibly it contributed. Uh, thanks, Marion. And, and we also see uh, gender differences in other issue priorities. So this comes from the 2019 data, um, not yet from this election, but in the last election. Uh, so people tend to see the coalition as being better on economic issues and labour as being better on health, education and the environment. And the data also shows that uh, these are issues that women care more about than men. So labour already has an advantage in issues that women tend to care about, even if it wasn't particularly a focus of campaigning in this election. So I know in the last election, the, the top issue priority for men was economic issues at about 30% and then about 15% on health. And those proportions were reversed for women about 30%, so health was their top concern compared to about 15% who said it was the economy. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious that there's very little variability in the other for whatever category. Is there any um, explanation for that for us? Because others include informal. Um, do you want to? Sorry. That's right. Uh, yeah, so, so two responses to that. One is, um, yep, yeah, is it on? Uh. Oh, sorry, my fault. No, it's, it's just the other way. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I think so. Okay, there you go. Uh, I'll speak loudly. Um, yeah, so two, two responses. One is the other category uh, includes independence and One Nation, a United Australia Party. And what that, you kind of, it, it's essentially going in opposite directions. Uh, so you have a very, um, uh, quite substantial variation within that grouping. Uh, so for, for these figures, we've excluded those who were, uh, who didn't vote, uh, who didn't know who they voted for, uh, and also those who were ineligible to vote, although we do have their intentions pre-election. Um, but yeah, you're right, there is a, the other is, is a very, um, uh, the, the moving in opposite directions for a number of the, the variables which we're using. Uh, so, you know, education will predict a higher vote for the Teal independent candidate candidates, but a lower vote for One Nation and, and United Australia Party. So I think it's kind of hiding a lot. Uh, and, and Ian does talk a little bit about uh, kind of the Teal candidates in, in his presentation after the break, uh, but it's also something we need to obviously look at in a lot more detail. I think there's someone up the back and then here. I'll, I'll, I'll shout. A fan <laughs> quiz from the Australia Institute. Uh, thanks for the data and the presentation. It's lots of interesting stuff to get into. Oh, I, um, I was wondering about the gender divide question. Um, I've seen some other data suggesting it was bigger. Our own exit poll has, has a wider gap of about 7% um, at this election. I just wonder how confident you are about that. I wonder another way potentially into it is that we need to consider the gender gap on 2PP basis rather than primary voting intention basis to give a potentially a better guide given the drop and the decline in the major party vote across elections. And, and I was reflecting upon that when looking at your slide five showing how many votes have shifted from Labor to the Greens and how many votes have shifted from the Coalition to Labor and vice versa. That actually to get a better guide over time would be to look at the gender gap on 2PP terms. Finally, um, I'm often, uh, when seeing data like this, it reminds me that, and I'd like your reflection whether this is true, that really the biggest um, factor in determining people's vote is not uh, income, is not education, is not gender, is not uh, religious affiliation. It is by overwhelming the best predictor is age. And is that still the case? Thank you. Yep, this is a terrific point about the two-party preferred, and if I ran those same analyses on the two-party preferred basis, I haven't done it yet, but I believe we'd see um, 
perhaps a more pronounced gender voting gap because then you're taking into account the fact that most of those Greens votes flow to Labor, also the distinction between uh, the Teal independents and uh, those voting for One Nation or the United Australia Party. Uh, in terms of age being um, the major factor, I can perhaps pass that one on to Inti, but we do see these big uh, and growing generational divides um, and also uh, gaps based on, on education as well. So gender isn't the most important socio-demographic factor. I just, yeah, it's just that, I mean, I'm not saying there aren't, each of those aren't important factors, but when you step back and take a big, bigger picture look, it really is overwhelmingly the biggest factor, not the only one, but the biggest one is consistently and has been forever is, is age. Or am I wrong? <laughs> Uh, you're not wrong, I think Nick and Ian can speak to that as well. I believe their paper shows the biggest factors in this election are age and education. Yep. Uh, I don't know if anyone would like to add to uh, that. I'll go first and then uh, I'll talk about the data and then uh, Inti can talk about the much more eloquently the interpretation. Um, so very much so, uh, age uh, was not only explained the cross-sectional uh, differences, uh, but also was the most important factor in explaining the flows between 2019 and 2022. So it's not only that there was a, a large gap in 2019, which there was, uh, but uh, young Australians who voted for the coalition uh, were far more likely to have changed their vote away from the coalition compared to older Australians. Uh, so there's both the swing and the levels. Um, but uh, I would... Uh, uh, and, and Ian and, and Sarah would have a much better long-term perspective than me. Uh, you kind of made the point that uh, age has always been the case, uh, and I think that's true. But I think what the data suggests to me is that if you think about the things which are becoming more important, that education, both in Australia and internationally, is, is a better predictor of vote than it would have been uh, previously. Um, just to add to what has been already said, obviously um, Ian and Nick shows that um, this election age and education have been um, the two um, driving sort of factors. If we're talking over time, um, then it's not really age, it's generation. So if you uh, look into the three time effects which tend to be highly correlated, um, being age, period and generation, and if you look into long-term um, voting behaviour, then rather than age, it is uh, generation, so depending on um, the experiences of um, you know, particular birth cohorts um, and also the, um, the culmination of progressive values, also the boom in education, the societal and cultural changes over time, um, that is a stronger predictor of um, of the vote long term, not age, uh, not so not life cycle effect, but rather which generation you belong to. When were you young? Was it 30 years ago, or, or are you young now? Thank you. You might have to shout. I'm afraid. Oh, okay, that's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, Helen Sullivan from um, CAP. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm not a, a, a data expert, so this may be a stupid question, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and then I, I, I want to ask Mark something. So my stupid question comes to this point about age and, and generation and into your presentation, which was, was fascinating, and they, they were all fascinating. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, if, and this is where I'm going to come to, to Mark in a moment, you know, if, I'm, if I'm a liberal or a, or a national party uh, person, then am I looking at this data and thinking, well, you know, we've got a problem generationally, or am I thinking that maybe as this, these generations get older, their attitudes might come back more towards um, what it is that the lives of the nationals. As, you know, so it, it's the adage, and it is an adage, and I have no doubt, it, but you know that as you get older, you become more conservative. I'm also horrified to discover that I am now in the older <laughs> So I'm really interested in what the data tells us about what what happens over time um, as a, as 
and, and the risk of predicting on the basis of this data what, what might happen in the future. Um, because I, you know, I just wonder if people do become more concerned to the time. I don't know. And Mark, I'm just wondering, on the basis of what of what you've heard so far this morning, how you has has, has anything like this come up in the conversations that you've been having with the the, the loops in particular about you know how, because it seems to me that what's being reported in public is that they're not paying any attention to these issues. They're, they're talking more about you know we need to reconnect with our base, and our base doesn't care about any of this stuff. What's left of it? <laughs> well, did. did you want to respond to the demo? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that is a very, very, very important question. Now, when you see graphs like this, and you know, I show you life cycle effects, or show um, age of effects based on uh, effects based on age, um, it is really important to ask: Okay, are these people going to grow up? to go back to major parties. Now, um, the analysis that I did using the Australian election study um, last year, looking at um, you know, voting behaviors from 87 to 2019, what I actually did is uh, look into all the three time effects, so, which is really hard to disagree, uh, disaggregate from each other if you don't have a long span of data. So um, not going too much into the statistical analysis, but what I did is try to isolate the three. And in Australia, um, it it's life cycle effect. It's not the life cycle effect, uh, which is uh, as important when it comes to electoral behavior. Um, generation effect is quite important. So um, according to my analysis, um, these people, there's a higher chance that these people will not grow up to, um, to go back to major parties unless, you know, major parties somehow magically tend to woo younger generations uh, by, you know, directly look into their issues, etc. Uh, and the reason for this is because um, education is a very big reason, you know, as uh, younger generations tend to have higher, so the rates of higher education, tertiary education is more compared to older generations, which means that they don't really have to rely on partisan cues to make political decisions. Also, they tend to be more critical and expect more of uh, political representatives. So that means that, okay, if you are not addressing issues that uh, impact me, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna go for the doors. It's almost like that, right? Because you don't need to understand, you don't need cognitive shortcuts anymore to understand politics. You can based on the resources that you already have. So to answer your question, um, I, it, well, I do have to do longer term analysis over the next years, but there's a very, uh, there's a low chance that this is going to happen. People are going to grow older to vote for major parties. Thanks, Helen. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, look, I think the, the, the question related to, you know, whether the, I, I suppose particularly the Liberal Party having been in a hammer at the election, whether it understands or the coalition more broadly understands w where it's at and what damage has been done to its base and whether, it, I, I suppose, you know, those voters are going to come back to it over time. Um, I, I suspect uh, there's a degree of denial going on. Um, I also suspect there's a degree of kind of tactical positioning going on uh, with some of the messaging we're seeing from Peter Dutton and others because, um, you know, that's politics in a sense. You know, what, what you think and what you say quite frequently aren't preci don't precisely sort of um, overlap. Uh, and uh, at the moment, I mean, Dutton's first point when he came out of the, uh, the you know, came, emerged as the new leader, there was no real recognition of what the electorate had just said. There was no real recognition of the women question. Susan Lee, who is the new deputy, was left to address that question. Um, and Dutton really didn't show any great uh, sort of, he didn't even do the traditional, um, we accept the, the, you know, the, the lessons of this election, we heard the message of the voters, didn't really do much of that. The, the key message was about, we're not going to be Labor light, and we're going to spend the next three years, and this was bearing in mind before the ministry was sworn in, we're going to spend the next three years putting together a program that will fix the mess that the Labor government will inevitably leave. So he was already... Uh, in full opposition mode in his thinking and everything else. So um, whether they are going to come to appreciate it, I don't know. But there's a lot of people who probably appreciate it in a very visceral sense at the moment because they no longer have jobs. 
uh, and they sort of see what, you know, where the particular sort of culture war division approach has, has, has taken them. And I think that's going to be a really interesting debate inside the, the Liberal Party going forward. I don't think it's uh, exclusively... The, the messages in this elections are not exclusively negative for the Liberal Party. There are some worrying signs for, I guess, a number of political forces. Uh, and as I said, I think, um, I think the Greens uh, you know, did extraordinarily well here. They've been talked about for a long time. And, and then suddenly it happened. Uh, you know, this quite significant uh, um, beachhead in the, in the House of Reps. I mean, Ban Adam Bant's held the seat of Melbourne now for several terms, but it kind of, you know, it was always going to happen and never did at a number of elections, and now it has. But I do think that's going to present, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking at you, Ben, as well, in this, having had some uh, association with the Greens, um, that I do think it's going to present the Greens with a, an interesting challenge uh, going, you know, in, in, as they present now looking to represent a whole electorate, the whole spectrum, all of the people that we've seen, all the different demographics that we've seen represented in these uh, tables here, are now going to have a Greens representative in a number of those electorates and they'll be expecting a different kind of politics and uh, or a different kind of representation from perhaps that which the Greens have been able to rely on before because it's one thing to get a slice of a state uh, to put together quotas which you do in the Senate. It's another thing to hold on to, um, to, to sort of broadly representative geographical areas and perhaps Melbourne as an electorate is not atypical in that sense or is not typical I should say in that sense um, and so that's going to be a challenge but you know there are challenges all the way around. Now I think that, to reflect on that Mark, you think that they've got two seats, the one from the Labor Party and the one two seats from the Liberal Party to underscore your point about a broad constituency that needs representing it because it's demonstrated right there in that fact. Okay, we're going to have one more question and then you'll get your coffee, I'm afraid. I'm afraid this lady had her hand up earlier, sir. So if you could ask your question of the speakers out in the, when we have coffee, that'd be great. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm Sonny Kamiyar. I'm also with the College of Asian Pacific. My question's around gender equality. Um, thank you very much for all of your presentations. If we take the narrative, though, that what you presented here is really in the aggregate, but the election was 151 different polls, and that that is continuing to present pollsters and analysts with difficulties to understand what will actually happen. Um, I'm very interested in, of course, the teal seats. And I'm wondering whether any of you have looked specifically at those seats and where the kinds of gender analysis um, has broken down, if you've been able to do that. Um, or whether you have any kind of sense of how those those teals won, on, on whose votes did they win? Uh, I'll talk quickly. Um, so at the, at the risk of stealing the thunder from the next oh. session, uh, so uh, Ian will touch on that a tiny bit, and, and one of the things we have I able to look at is, is who the teals voted for previously, but I'm not going to tell you that because you have to come back after morning tea. <laughs> um, but what we have, what we do have on the survey, though, is the electorate which someone voted in. Uh, and so what we're able to, even though we're not able to look at um, the... Uh, it, we don't have enough sample size for each particular electorate, we are able to match the candidates in the electorate uh, and how that uh, influences kind of the national vote. Uh, and there you do get really interesting patterns. And certainly where there are a, a, uh, a female candidate in an electorate, uh, it certainly influenced the vote uh, of not only female uh, 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 voters or respondents, uh, but also those who themselves uh, um, answered some of the questions like Sarah put up about uh, a, a, a need for increased representation or a view that uh, sexual harassment in the workplace is an issue or a view that um, uh, uh, equality uh, has not gone far enough. Uh, so the candidates clearly mattered and, and I think that's where our survey can help. Uh, but in terms of what happened in each individual electorate, I think they're kind of reliant on, on kind of the aggregate data, the, the, the administrative data and 
in, uh, you don't have to wait till after the morning tea, you have to wait till next Tuesday to see when the 2021 census data comes out uh, and to see how the changing demographics in some of these electorates uh, will have affected that vote. Everybody to the second section, the second panel today. Uh, my name is Tracy Fenwick. I'm an associate professor at the School of Politics and International Relations at the ANU, and I am chairing this um, panel. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is Professor Ian McAllister from the School of Politics and International Relations. Um, I'm sure many of you do know Ian. He is a distinguished professor of political science. From 1997 until 2004, he was the director of the Research School of Social Sciences at the ANU. He has previously held chairs at the University of New South Wales and the University of Manchester. Um, he was a president of the British Politics Group from 2001 to 2002. Ian edited the Australian Journal of Political Science from 2004 to 2010. And he was a chair of the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems Project from 2003 to 2008. He is, also an he is also a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, he, it's not mentioned in his bio, but he also directed the research and supervised many of our panelists here in the room today. And so there is a bit of a legacy um, as well among the other panelists of Ian's dedication and research in this field. Uh, second speaker will be Dr. Jill Shepherd from the School of Politics and International Relations as well. Jill is a researcher and a senior lecturer in the School of Politics. Her research focuses on why people participate in politics, what opinions they hold and why, and how both are shaped by political institutions and systems. Her current projects include studies of ethnic political participation in Australia, opinion formation and electoral behavior, compulsory voting and its effects on voters, and social class in Australia. Her recent papers have focused on participation and voting and have been published in Australian and internationally. Methodologically, Jill's research interests focus on sampling and field population-based surveys, questionnaire design, and respondent recruitment and retention. She's an investigator on Australia's contribution to the Asian Barometer and World Value Survey projects and the Australian Election Study, as well as offering the ANU poll. Our third presenter, Nick, has already been introduced, so I will not introduce him again. Um, I would like to say that um, as all three researchers uh, are colleagues that focus on political behavior, I'm sure most of you know, but uh, the election was only in May and it's June. Uh, so these people dedicate a tremendous amount of, for, re for academics, very fast research time, very fast data gathering, and they have dedicated a tremendous amount of personal time in the last six to eight weeks um, on these projects, and I'd just like to thank them all for their contributions. So without further ado, we'll start with Professor Ian McAllister. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to look at the role of leaders in the election, and particularly the popularity of the leaders. And then what I'll do is look at the extent to which leaders really encapsulated the the two major crises we had that flowed into the election, first of all the floods and also of course the pandemic. And that brings into focus how the leaders actually handled it because it was we were basically national crises and people expect national leaders to step up and deal with those crises. So the 2022 election was really interesting because of this role of leaders and the extent to which it intersected with uh, these two major crises. What we, uh, what we did in the CSES survey was ask people what they thought about the popularity of the political leaders on what we call a thermometer scale, running from zero to 10. We also have data going back right to 1987 from the Australian Election Study Survey. I'll show you some of the long-term trends in a minute. Basically, this is how the leaders were viewed <coughs> in uh, the 22 election. It's also worth saying that just a cursory glance at some of the correlations between leadership and the vote and partisanship suggests that leaders were probably more important in this election than any previous election that we've looked at. Now that's actually a long-term trend called the personalization of politics, a much greater focus on leaders by um, voters, but it looks as if in this election 
perhaps because of a confluence of various factors that uh, leadership was a more important factor in swaying the vote than any time in the past. What we can see from this is that um, Scott Morrison and uh, Barnaby Joyce were really very unpopular with the broader electorate. Scott Morrison scored 3.6, Amina 3.6 on the 0 to 10 scale. Uh, Barnaby Joyce scored even lower at 3. Anthony Albanese was midway in terms of his popularity, about 5.6 and Adam Bant was 4.6. The interesting thing here is that when we look at the, the light colour bar, you can actually see that Scott Morrison was even relatively unpopular <coughs> among his own voters, uh, liberal voters. Uh, they ranked him at 6.8, and that compares with 7.4 for Anthony Albanese, and also 7.2 for Adam Bant uh, in the Greens. The figure for Barnaby Joyce is slightly misleading because uh, it's estimated based on all coalition voters because we really don't have enough national party voters in the survey to look at them separately. If we put that in a longer term perspective, going back to 1987 when the very first Australian election study survey was conducted, you can see that Scott Morrison is the, the most unpopular liberal leader since we started doing those surveys. Quite possibly, if we'd been doing this uh, further back from 1987, he might have even been more, more unpopular than that. The second most unpopular leader was uh, uh, Peacock, Andrew Peacock, in 1990. And then at the other end of the scale, you can see that John Howard, uh, particularly in 1996 and 2004, um, was very, uh, very popular. The other thing that's worth noting about this is the decline in Scott Morrison's popularity between 2019 and uh, 2022. And you can see he declined from a, a quite respectable 5.1 to 3.6. That's a very considerable decline. And if we compare that, for example, to the decline in Abbott's popularity, he went down from 4.9 to 4.3, uh, which was much less. So by any standards, Scott Morrison was uh, very unpopular in that election and also the most unpopular liberal leader that we've seen over uh, at least three or four decades. And I've just given you the uh, website link for the Australian Election Study there if you wanted to look at this in a bit more detail. Sarah and I have a, a paper, Trends in Australian Political Opinion, where we look at a lot of this in detail, and particularly look at the personal qualities of the leaders. That's the popularity of Labour leaders over the, the same period. And you can see there that uh, Albanese is in the midpoint of all of those leaders. Bill Shorten in 2019 was the, the least popular Labour leader that that we polled. Um, also, Kevin Rudd, Mark II, um, in 2013 was also very unpopular. You can also see um, a couple of patterns there. You can see the decline in Kevin Rudd's popularity between those two elections. And you can also see the decline in uh, Bill Shorten's popularity between 2000 and, uh, 2016, 2019. And that's the, the figure for national party leaders over the same period. And again, that shows the same story that we saw for the liberal leaders, that Barnaby Joyce was the, the least popular national party leader over that period. Um, second only to Ian Sinclair in 1987 and Charles Blunt in 1990. John Anderson, 2001-2004, uh, was the most popular. Um, National Party leader. So to move on to the, the two crises that um, we examined in the election and estimated their effect and how people voted, obviously the first one was the pandemic. And we asked three sets of questions about the pandemic. There's a battery of items, three separate items, about the effect of the pandemic in terms of how it affected social cohesion, how it affected democracy 
um, how it affected the economy. And you can see there that 55% of people actually thought that social, the pandemic had had a positive effect on social cohesion. 40% thought that it had a positive effect on democracy. And about one in three said it had a positive effect on the economy. So basically people were moderately positive about the effects of the pandemic. They didn't think it was an absolute disaster. Um, people did think uh, it had a negative effect on social occasion, but that was only three out of ten and only one out of four thought it had a negative effect on democracy. The second question we asked was whether somebody, the person or somebody in their household had caught COVID, and we found that basically half said that they had or somebody in the household had. And then the third question we asked was what they thought of the government performance in the pandemic. And you can see there that opinions were really quite evenly divided. A total of 46% of people thought that the government had done a bad job in the pandemic, and 54% thought they'd, had a, they'd done a good job. About 4 out of 10 thought they'd done a reasonable job, which you can see there, 41%, 13% uh, thought they'd done a very good job. In terms of the impact of the floods, we were interested in this because um, in the April survey, Nick had included items about how it affected the, the general population. You can see that it actually had a much wider impact than we might think. And again, we're talking about the national population. We're not carrying this down to the eastern states. 7% of people, for example, reported that uh, property had been damaged by the floods. 14% reported that travel had been disrupted. And in terms of having a, a friend or a family member having their property threatened, we're talking about 22%. When we add all those things together, around about 4 in 10 of the general electorate said that they had at least one of those impacts uh, in terms of their lives. So, Quite a large impact. Um, one of the things we will do later is we also have data on the bushfires going back in the panel survey, and we look at the relative effects of the pandemic, the floods, and the bushfires in terms of uh, how people voted in the election. So what we then did in this was to look at the <coughs> relative effects of popularity the impact of the pandemic and the impact of the floods in terms of how it shifted the votes. And how we did that was to estimate a log logistic regression model. We controlled for social background characteristics and then we estimated two models. The first model is the light coloured bars which shows the effect without leaders in the equation. And the second model shows it when we add equations in. And the odds ratios have been converted to percentage probabilities to give you an estimate of the extent to which people have a, a probability of voting for a particular party based on one of these characteristics. Um, we've taken out social background here, so we've just focused on leaders and the pandemic and the floods. What we can see here with the, the light colored bars, without leaders, the, by far the major impact was how people perceived the government's handling of the pandemic. You can see it has a major effect, 35% uh, probability of voting for the coalition if you thought the government had handled um, the pandemic well. Once we controlled for leaders, you can see that was reduced by more than half. Um, and we can also see that leaders works in the way that we might expect. So if people rated Morrison half more highly, more likely to vote for the coalition. If they um, rated Albanese negatively, less, uh, more likely to vote for the coalition and so on. The relative size of the bars don't actually reflect the, the relative effects of leadership versus the pandemic because there's a bit of different scoring. What we're trying to do here was actually just look at the extent to which leaders mediated the effect of the pandemic. The other thing that's interesting here is that um, the extent to which people thought the pandemic was negative on society, and it's a combination of those three measures that I mentioned before, economy, democracy, and social cohesion, really doesn't matter. 
Whether or not they had caught COVID or somebody in their household had didn't matter in terms of the vote, and also floods didn't matter. So that if, if they'd had some exposure to the floods, either through property damage, feeling anxious, or through a family friend, it didn't matter in terms of how they voted. What mattered was the pandemic, and to a large extent in the coalition vote, that was mediated by uh, the impact of leaders. In terms of the Labour vote, you can see those patterns replicated again, but even more so. <coughs> you can see the effect of people's perceptions of the government handling of the pandemic really had a major effect on the Labour vote. But once we control for leaders, it disappears to virtually nothing. So, um, indeed, when we do that separately for Morrison and Albanese, uh, as we would expect, a lot of this is mediated through Morrison's own popularity. Again, you can see the other variables don't matter very much. The effect of the pandemic, whether or not we've caught COVID, personal impact of the floods, none of those are statistically significant. Now, Tony and Nick mentioned we did do a bit of work on the teal vote. We can identify teal voters because, as Nick mentioned, we have electorate coded into the data. We know there was 20 independent candidates that received funding from Climate 200, and there was another two that were offered funding and didn't take it. So there's basically 22 independent candidates in there and we can identify who voted for them separately. There's only 118 in the survey, so we can't do too much with them in terms of any statistical reliability. But what I've done here is to look at the extent to which uh, these variables to do with the crisis and popularity affected the Teal vote. And again, you can see um, how the government handled the pandemic was a major factor without leaders. Once we put leaders into the regression model, it disappears to virtually nothing. The other interesting thing there is, apart from the fact that the, the other variables which I mentioned before aren't statistically significant, is you can see there's effect for Morrison's popularity, but not for Albanese's popularity. And when we actually looked at who Teal voters were, and you can see that in the third dot point, we find that a majority of them actually have voted Labour or Green in the 2019 election. In fact, there was more former Labour voters in there than former Liberal voters by a factor of almost two to one. So what was going on there clearly in those seats was a quite extensive use of tactical voting. There's quite a bit of literature, international literature, about tactical voting, and it tends to show that Tactical voters in certain circumstances can be about one in ten uh, of voters in a particular seat. Within these seats, we were talking about many more. So there's quite a high degree of sophistication among a lot of these voters because they're actually working out how their vote could be counted, what would be most effective in uh, unseating the incumbent liberal, and they're casting their vote in that way. And that's something that we'll be looking at in a lot more detail uh, when we get the Australian election study data later in the year. So in terms of what all this means, well, as I've suggested, the coalition leaders, both of them in 22, were the most unpopular of any party leaders that we've polled since 1987. Morrison, in particular, was a major drag on the Liberal vote. But a lot of this was really encapsulated in the perception that the government had not handled the pandemic well. Teal voters, as I mentioned, um, not disaffected liberals to any great extent. They were tactical labor and green voters. And I'll leave it there. Nick so much for organising all of this and for getting the data to us so quickly. Uh, before I start, I do want to give a bit of a plug um, to the, the CSES, which is the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems. It's only something that most of you in the room haven't heard of before. Um, and that's because up until the last two elections, 
Uh, we've run this core sort of module of questions that, that, that comprises the CSES uh, as part of the election study, the Australian election study. So the CSES is basically the global network of individual national election studies. Australia's been a part of this network from the start. Uh, through Ian's involvement, he's been chair of this network. Uh, I'm currently working on uh, the sort of the group that has come up with the questions for the next um, for the next module. This is a massively powered, like massively powerful and really unused data source in Australia uh, through the CSES website. They're based out of Mannheim in Germany, uh, but they have uh, the data from every country over time. Uh, all downloadable for free. It's just a, an incredible resource that I'm sort of, yeah, probably uh, contractually obliged, obliged to plug, but also it's a source of sort of personal uh, pride, I guess, to be involved in this project, and it's really, really great to be presenting the results today. Um, so as, look, following on from Ian's, uh, I guess, summary, that a lot of this election result was wrapped up in, in voter dislike of Scott Morrison, I want to push that a little bit further and say, in my, to my view, this election wasn't that abnormal. I don't think it was an earthquake sort of result. Uh, I think we saw the coalition lose a lot of seats, uh, but I don't think that fundamentally it's going to reshift um, Australian political alignment or anything else. What I do want to talk about, though, is uh, the experience of voting for the independents and what effect I think that will have potentially on maybe not a generation of Australian voters but certainly on voters who whether for tactical reasons and I think Ian's will be right that a lot of this voting for uh, for, teal, uh, for teal candidates in particular was driven by not necessarily you know climate change or women's issues and we may find as we dig deeper than it was but I think there's a strong degree of negative partisanship in Australia that we haven't really explored and a lot of people just hate the lips Right? A lot of people sitting in this room, you know, I think hate the, hate the Liberal Party. Uh, and that's, that's totally fine, but it's a form of partisanship. And understanding what drives that is really important. Now, we've all commented on the fact that uh, the major party vote in Australia has been in long-term decline. Uh, the AES is one reason that we know this, but also, you know, AEC returns, we can see this from decline in primary votes. Uh, anyone who's paid attention to Australian politics won't be particularly shocked by this news. At the same time, we've seen trust in our political institutions in similar sort of long-term decline, but a lot slower. Now, Australia is largely protected from a lot of these international trends, you know, where trust in the Supreme Court, I was just looking at um, a graph on Twitter, the trust in the Supreme Court in the US has just fallen through the floor. We don't get the highs and lows. There's a few reasons for that that are peripheral to today, but uh, when we see a decline, it's long, you know, it, it has a sort of long tail. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand this election in that context. The most important point, and again, this is something that Ian's been banging on about for years, and I bang on about it at every opportunity, is that the parties haven't responded. And we know this because after every, every Australian election study, we send the report to we don't do it anymore in hard copy because it's too expensive, but we used to send it to every legislator in the federal parliament, all 150 at the time. Members would get a copy of the report and we would write a little, uh, you know, sort of uh, take note of this uh, letter on the front and it would say, you need to do something, this is bad. Right? <laughs> Voters don't like you and, and they're voting because of compulsory voting um, but like this is this is sort of in your hands as democratic leaders. I remember we did it one year and one, and we offered meetings. And this was only a couple of elections ago. And one uh, MP replied, and he's subsequently. And I have great faith in this um, Labor MP, and he's subsequently retired. So, as far as we know, there's no one in the parties who really have a an incentive or b an interest to do anything about this long-term decline in political trust. So by way of proof, here's data from one of our other surveys, the, um, the World Value Survey between uh, 1981 
and 2018 and the green bars show you who had a great deal or quite a lot of trust in the federal parliament and you can see how that has uh, again not gone through the floor but it's in pretty terminal decline that dark red bar of people who have no trust at all in the federal parliament is getting up towards 20 percent it's two in ten people who just say they have no trust at all in the Australian Parliament. If we weren't otherwise a stable democracy, we'd be really worried about this. Another way of looking at this is through the election study uh, and the question we ask that people in government look after themselves, uh, that they don't uh, look after sort of the many, uh, they can't be trusted to uh, represent the interests of, of most Australians is the, the sort of dichotomous part of that question. And between 93 and 2007, it did bounce around a fair bit. 2007 was the, the turning point for a lot of these trends. Uh, the very exciting election of Kevin Rudd, we all got enthused, we got engaged. Uh, we thought that uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these trends would, would stabilise. The election of 2010, I want to hone in on at this point because that's where we saw the reversal of a lot of the, the pro-Kevin Rudd uh, post-election optimism. Now at the time, a lot of the commentary around, uh, around that was that Australia wasn't ready for a female Prime Minister, uh, you know, there was sort of a lot of latent sexism, uh, Julia Gillard was, you know, objectively uh, subjected to a lot of, uh, you know, knifing and, and um, undermining by her male colleagues, you know, all, and all of these things are true. But something that uh, I don't think we talk about much was the effect of the hung parliament. And in those 17 days after the 2010 election, when Australia wasn't quite sure whether they would have minority government for the first time in living memory, or whether we would return to uh, a normal kind of, you know, business as usual majority government for Australian politics. Now, Again, something that you know, a lot of us in the room do talk about a lot is that this is completely normal across the world to have uh, a consensual type government with many, uh, many parties in the governing coalition is the norm across the democratic world, but we are very not used to that in Australia. And what happened, I think we underestimated the effect of that on Australians' uh, satisfaction with the system. How could this happen that Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor and Bob Catter all of a sudden had all this power? And this really fueled something that I've been interested in, and it's how we are um, so angry with the parties. We have so little trust in the parties and in the parliament, how it functions. But when we ask questions about compulsory voting, 85% plus say that they A, support compulsory voting, and B, would vote even if it was voluntary. Right, so how do we reconcile those things? We don't like the choices on offer. We're not really going to vote for independence until now, but we're still happy to keep voting. And I think what we saw in, 2000, in 2022 was the kind of um, culmination of those two trends. We've seen a viable alternative now, and we are going to vote for them. So what I want to talk about in the, like, the sort of data-driven part of, um, of this presentation is, is how we feel now as voters, and particularly how those independent voters feel. Did having the option, did having the viable independent option actually make them feel better about Parliament? And we don't often have data that, um, that captures voters' uh, responses so soon after an election. The AES is in the field at the moment, but the field work goes for months. By the time we have reached everyone we want to reach in the population, um, you know, we will have results four months down the line. This kind of really quick turnaround uh, data is, is new and really fun for us. So is this feeling, right, and I'm sure you've read it, and I pick on the Guardian a little bit here because it's like, easy to do, but <coughs> I'm sure you've seen headlines about, stop laughing at me, Matt, um, about how excited everyone is now, right? I'm sure you've been responsible for some of it too, Mark. Everyone feels good. Everyone woke up on the 22nd and went, wow, it's a whole new day. Uh, this is from a, a, a publication called Chemistry World. Uh, researchers are very excited. Uh, the Guardian are very excited. We feel something between hope and relief. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic that the new Labor government will do more to address climate change. 
uh, or Catherine Murphy is uh, very relieved as well. <laughs> and this wasn't like I am, you know, I am kind of picking on a straw man a little bit, but this was this drove a lot of media narrative after the election. And some of that, I think, is driven by how much a lot of people hated uh, Scott Morrison, as he had shown. Looking at trust in institutions following uh, the election, we do see probably some kind of rebound in that trust in Parliament, uh, which is the third row from the bottom. And while most of us don't trust it completely, the, the modal response now is to trust it somewhat. The number who uh, do not trust Parliament at all seems to have uh, retreated back to a much healthier 10%. So that's good news for us. But comparing it to other uh, institutions, it's still not great. The only institution that we trust less than Parliament is social media, which is uh, fairly damning. An interesting point here, though, as well, is that often the idea of Parliament and government depends strongly on who we voted for. We can trust the 151 people uh, in Parliament House, but not necessarily trust uh, the Albanese-led government, particularly if we voted for the coalition. Now that's something that I want to sort of um, put a pin in, because I'm going to come back to that. And whether we do have greater trust in government, depending on who we voted for. And we find here that coalition voters actually say, have said in the days uh, following the election result, they have greater trust in parliament than do leaders of the coalition, than, than did voters for the ALP. Right? This isn't driven by kind of winner optimism. This isn't just guardian readers. This is being driven by coalition voters as much as anyone. And I wasn't quite sure how to explain this. And then halfway through Ed's talk, I thought, of course, it's, it's even coalition voters didn't like Scott Morrison. <laughs> so I think for a lot of coalition voters, there is probably a sense of relief. Um, party ID in Australia is stronger than anywhere in the world. We're not the most polarised country in the world, but we are the most likely to say that part of our social identity is partisan, that we are Labour or we are Liberal. And so a lot of people vote Liberal, even, you know, you have to hold your nose. You vote for your home party, even though in 2019 you really didn't like Bill Shorten because he was historically unpopular before this. You know, there would have been a lot of Liberal voters this year who voted for the coalition, coalition even though they didn't think Morrison should have gone to Hawaii. And now we're seeing probably a little bit of relief among coalition voters. Um, the other group that I was really interested in is that second from the top uh, row of people who voted for another party, so a minor or a micro party or an independent. I thought they might have felt pretty good in the days following the election. Right? You wanted <laughs> this sense, sorry, it was more aggressive than I said it, but you wanted this, right? You wanted the, the prospect of a hung parliament. A lot of them are probably disaffected, uh, sorry, not disaffected liberals, but sort of negative liberal partisans. They wanted the Liberal Party out, they got it. Why weren't they happy? And so what I'm really interested in going forward is, is what becomes of these independent voters now? Voting for an independent is, is a big deal. If you voted for a major party your whole life and now you've voted for an independent, um, what does that do to your expectations? I thought this may have been explained by the date of interview. I thought that uh, in the days leading up to Albanese getting that 76th seat that formed the majority government, that independent voters may have been more optimistic. You know, you're, you're independent. Zoe Daniel might have the balance of power. And so I tracked this day by day by day by day. And on about the 30th of May, which was when I think Anthony said, yeah, OK, we can call it now that we've got the 76, 76th seat, um, we would see that trust drop off. And it didn't. It, was it bounced around a little bit, but it was pretty stable uh, day by day. So there seems to be no effect of minority government or hung parliament on this sort of surprising disaffection um, among uh, independent and micro and minor party voters. So who still, who, who are the holdouts beside those? And we can see here, you know, it's a sort of obligatory uh, multivariate regression so that we can actually control for a bunch of other 
um, socio-demographic variables, age, gender, income, education. What I'm really interested in is um, the effect of uh, voting for another party or candidate that has really a really strong positive effect on distrust. Uh, whether you voted for the Greens, really strong positive effect on distrust. Uh, coalition voters, blah, blah, blah. And the other one at the top, uh, whether you're disabled or unable to work. I have never considered this before, uh, how that may have played out in the, the midst of COVID, uh, but it's probably had a massive effect that, that we haven't expected. Um, here's my summary. Trust does seem to be rebounding somewhat. That's a good thing. It, you know, we would have been worried if it had gotten much lower. It seems to be driven by major party supporters, which I think is really interesting, given how lax the major parties have been in actually responding to any of these trends. I wonder if that 2010 election that really threw us with the prospect of minority government, whether we're almost seeing reverse effect here, and it's not major party, voters who are upset by the prospect of, uh, of minority government, we might be becoming normalised to the idea of A, hung parliaments, and B, independents who aren't outside the mainstream. What did I just broke things? <laughs> Anyways, the last thing I was going to say was we'll be able to see the effect of policy uh, positions and a whole range of other variables. Once the AES comes out, we're saying September, um, and we'll see you all then. So, what I wanted to talk about, and I might just reorganise the, the order which I'm going to talk about things a little bit to, to kind of, um, uh, to, until the visuals uh, kind of come back. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a joint uh, presentation uh, with Simon Jackman. Uh, and what we wanted to do is maybe build on a little bit of what Inti presented, uh, which is kind of policy priorities prior to the election, uh, and then how they uh, affected not only people's votes, uh, but more interestingly, the change in people's votes. Um, and that's one of the powers of, of our data set, uh, is we not only have what people, who people would have voted for uh, in April, uh, but also who they said they voted for at the previous election. Um, so what I might do is I'll talk a little bit about uh, who changed their vote uh, as a bit of a kind of demographic intro, uh, and then I'll go on to uh, kind of how we, how we estimated the, the relationship with policy priorities, uh, and then uh, if the images are back, I'll show it. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll talk it through and you can take it on trust. Um, so. Uh, who changed their vote? Uh, so, firstly, it was pretty stable. Uh, so, the proportion of people who changed their vote uh, between uh, 2019 and 2022 uh, was almost exactly the same as it was uh, between 2016 uh, and uh, 2019. So, around about a quarter of people uh, kind of changed their vote uh, over that period. Um, so, we looked at, first we analysed um, uh, almost lost my uh, screens. I was really doing it. Uh, fancy footwork. Um, so first, we looked at all voters. Uh, so regardless of who you voted for in 2019, uh, what were the some of the factors which predicted whether you changed? Um, so one of the things which Mark mentioned, uh, and I think um, it says, are the Greens mainstream? Uh, well, one way you can uh, get a measure of that is a mainstream party kind of maintains its vote uh, and uh, with very little kind of movement across, it's established. Uh, people who vote for protest parties, they protest once uh, and they're unlikely to protest again. But what we found in our data, uh, and, and I think it, this is correct Ian, uh, is that uh, for the first time, or at least more so than previously, uh, Greens voters were the most stable of voters. Um, so, if you voted for the Greens in 2019, you're the most likely to, to not have changed your vote uh, um, between 2019 and 2022. So yes, the Greens are at least stable. Uh, whether that's mainstream or not is another question. Uh, uh, Inti's talked about uh, the, the effect of the youth vote and, and how the youth vote on uh, kind of issues rather than parties, and we certainly saw that in our data. 
uh, in that uh, older Australians were the least likely to have changed their vote compared to younger Australians. Um, uh, those born overseas in an English-speaking in English country are more likely to have changed their vote, so migration matters, but it's, it's, it matters a little bit where you migrate from. Uh, and those who live outside of a capital city uh, were the most likely to have um, uh, um, to, to have changed their vote. Um, so we also looked at former uh, coalition voters. Um, you're going to have to trust me. Uh, so, uh, I, th I think as I mentioned before, uh, one of the things we looked at is, okay, well let's focus on the swing uh, which had the largest impact on uh, the election, which is the movement away from coalition voters. Uh, and there we found two groups where there was quite large differences. Uh, so if you are aged under 55, uh, then uh, you have a 35% chance, uh, so if you're aged under 55, and you voted for the coalition in 2019, you had a 35% chance of changing your vote uh, between 2019 and 2022. Uh, if you are over 55, on the other hand, it goes down to 21%. Uh, so uh, almost uh, twice as many people under the age of 55 left the coalition compared to those uh, over 55. Um, uh, education also matters. Uh, so. Uh, if you've completed your 12 uh, and you voted for the coalition, uh, then you've got a 31% chance of, of leaving the coalition between 2019 and 2022. Uh, if you didn't complete your 12, on the other hand, that goes down to under 15%. Uh, so uh, the, it's the highly educated and the young uh, which left the coalition over the last um, uh, election period. What about policy issues? Uh, what was the role of policy priorities uh, in explaining uh, vote change? Uh, so the way we looked at this is, so as Inti mentioned, in April 2022, uh, we asked people to rank uh, their, their most important, what policies they thought the incoming government, whoever it is, uh, should focus on over the next 12 months. Um, so top 65% uh, said reducing the cost of living, 60% uh, said uh, fixing the aged care system, all the way down to 22% who said dealing with the issue of immigration. So that's what people cared about prior to the election, but how did that influence their results? So essentially the way we looked at this is we took all of those who, uh, um, uh, we took people, people who voted in both 2019 and 2022, uh, we then uh, look at the probability uh, of voting for a party other than the coalition uh, in 2022 uh, and we control for who they voted for, uh, knowing of course that uh, the, if you voted for the coalition you're, more, you're less likely to vote for the non-coalition and so we hold that constant. Uh, we also hold constant uh, a set of demographic and socioeconomic characteristics to see how does someone's policy view uh, affect that change. Um, so we winnowed down those 22 policy priorities, uh, essentially uh, getting rid of those which had no association uh, through kind of a, a, an iterative uh, uh, model selection. Uh, and uh, of the, we then found seven policy priorities uh, which predicted your change in vote. Um, and that's what that um, so, uh, essentially, those policy, if you thought that these three uh, issues, so these four issues were important to you when asked in April, you were far more likely to have left uh, the coalition. So remember, these is, this is holding constant, this is people who are coalition voters. Uh, if you thought that dealing with global climate change uh, was an issue, uh, then uh, you have about a 40% chance of leaving the coalition. Uh, if you didn't think of an issue, you had about a 22% chance. Uh, if you thought improving disaster relief uh, was a policy issue, uh, a, a top priority, uh, then you've got a higher percent chance of leaving the coalition uh, than if you didn't. Uh, and that kind of gets to Ian's point. So Ian looked at whether uh, people um, were, in, were themselves affected by the floods. Uh, and that doesn't appear to, to change people's votes too much. But uh, your views on whether the government dealt with the floods uh, or the bushfires is far more predictive than one's own experience. Uh, 
The other thing which mattered was uh, improving the way the political system works in Australia. Uh, so if you thought that was an issue, you were more likely to have left the coalition. And one which I didn't expect, uh, and uh, one which had a low priority but still uh, predicted uh, changes in vote, was addressing issues around race uh, in the country. Um, so compared to the US, uh, where that's, a, that's one of the top priorities of government, a very low priority in Australia, but still, uh, if you think that's a priority, you are more likely to have left the coalition. Uh, and to me, uh, given we didn't ask specifically about Indigenous issues and specifically about voice to parliament, this is potentially predict, uh, picking that up, picking that effect. Uh, but there's also three issues which were predictive of staying with the coalition. Um, so if you thought these were a top priority, uh, then you were far less likely to have left the coalition. Um, so if you thought that defending the country from future terrorist attacks was a top priority, then you got about a 19% chance uh, of deserting the coalition. If you didn't think it was a top priority, uh, it goes up to a little under 40%. Uh, so almost two and a half times as many people uh, uh, if that was the issue which you thought was a top priority. Um, other two are dealing with issues of immigration uh, and dealing with global trade issues. Uh, and these were the issues which uh, traditionally have had a strong uh, um, benefit to uh, kind of right or centre-right parties and which uh, the, the general population uh, saw as being of low priority for this election. So what does that mean? Uh, well, I guess if, uh, if you think uh, that, sorry, if these issues remain, uh, stop to say that. if they stop, if they uh, stop, if they become salient again, uh, um, then uh, that's likely to have uh, kind of the, the opposite effect to, to, to lead to that swing back to the coalition. Uh, but uh, if the Albanese government is able to uh, either deliver or, or, or perhaps even more importantly from a politics perspective, maintain the focus on issues <laughs> of uh, climate change, uh, disaster relief, uh, the political system and race uh, and some other issues, uh, then it's going to be very hard for the coalition to, to regain that support. Um, so I'll leave it there uh, without any visuals and then we'll uh, go on to uh, questions. morning and this afternoon and some of the questions you guys as the audience have already asked, it, 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 it's really clear that the context of the 2022 elections was different. Um, and in that sense, we know that the context was critical. So people talked about the bushfire, COVID-19, the floods. So my question to the group, because this was the theme of, of the, whole, the whole day we've had, whether that critical context is going to become a critical juncture for Australian politics. Um, and so my question to all of the panelists is, and Jill has already answered this a little bit, is do you really believe that this is a realignment and these, this critical, these are going to be critical elections that become a critical juncture for Australian political behaviour? Or are we simply seeing, which we also saw in your data, that this is simply a protest vote against Scott Morrison's leadership and perceived incompetency in dealing with those critical, that critical context. Oh. <laughs> um, realignment and dealignment are quite technical terms. There's a big international literature about what represents a, a realigning election. What we've seen in Australia over the last 15 to 20 years has been an increase in voting volatility. So, for example, if we go back to the 1970s, round about 75-80% of people never changed their vote. In the very first election they voted in to the last election before they died. These days, in the 2019 election study, it was 47, 48%, something like that. So it's almost halved. If we take other indicators like split ticket voting, splitting your vote between the House of Reps and the Senate, that's been in increasing incrementally. The, it's been an increase in the proportion of people say they're not partisans. So there's a long-term change going on. And what we've seen in this election is it's suddenly broken out into the party system. So there's 
this alleged crisis in the Liberal Party and how they adapt, can they adapt, are they going to split and so on. But in fact, the underlying structural conditions that have created this have actually been going on for some considerable time. And that's what Jill was saying in terms of trust in politicians and so on. So whether or not this election is a, a realigning election, a dealigning election, I'm not sure, but it's part of a continuum of changes that have been taking place. And I would have thought would probably continue to take place for a lot of the reasons that Inti and other people were mentioning, generational change, the expansion of higher education, the rise of identity politics, and so on. Yeah, I think two things really... Well, no. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I don't think there's anything massively special about this election. But I think two things are really interesting now. One is, do the Libs respond? I, something that struck me about, say, Goldstein, and I'll be interested to hear what you think, Mark, like, it was sort of the first, it was always going to be the first domino to fall, right, among these liberal health seats in, um, oh my God, if I hear one more person say, it's not, it's not actually in the, the inner city, it's like Brighton, it may as well be the inner city, right, like socio-demographically. Um, it was always sort of going to be the first domino to fall. And I think it was a really good entry point. I don't know how smart Simon Holmes Accord is. I, I don't... I think they got lucky as much as anything. If you're a Goldstein voter... I don't know if it's pronounced Goldstein or Goldstein, so Goldstein. I'll go between. Goldstein. Um, if you're a Goldstein voter, and... I, I know the Wilson family, so I've, I don't know... This, this sounds like a massive kind of personal slight, but you don't want Tim Wilson as your local member, right? You want a future Prime Minister, and that was never going to be Tim, right? Ku Yong, I think, you know, is a little bit different in that regard, and that I was really su genuinely surprised by Ku Yong. So my point is, what does the Liberal Party do? Who do they put up in Goldstein next time that, that wins enough voters back? At, they don't, have the, they don't have the infrastructure internally to do it. Uh, they are beholden by old conservatives. And we know who joins political parties. It is the modal political party member is, is elderly, has, I won't say too much, has a lot of time on their hands. Um, and usually are more, are closer to the extremes of the ideological spectrum than are the actual legislators, right? So you've got a bunch of old men in the Liberal Party who are blocking change. And I don't think, Mark touched on this too, I don't think there's been much sign of reflection or self-awareness in the Liberal Party since, since the election. I don't think a bunch of Liberal Party members are going to say, oh, actually, our next member for Goldstein needs to be the first Liberal prime, you know, female Prime Minister. I just I can't see that happening. The second is what the independents do now, right? How they legislate. I'm not surprised, but I think it's a cool finding that a lot of the teal voters are strategic Labor voters, maybe less so green, but uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. But where do they go next time? Where do they go in 2025? Zoe Daniels probably an MP now for 12 years. She's probably entrenched in the way that Wilkie is, I would say. Um, so I think for the Liberal Party, you've got to see a lot of those seats as having gone, right? They're, for the next half a generation, they're, you're not getting them back, um, which is good because you don't have the, the uh, strategy to get them back anyway. Does it expand, though, beyond those seats? I, I think probably not. I don't know. That, I just trailed off. That's right. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, um, so I... Um, I guess my response would be, now that we've got some slides up, uh, <laughs> a kind of a, a, a to, to reflect on kind of the policy issues uh, which mattered. Uh, and I think this is once again where the, the power of the long-term data collection uh, really helps. Uh, so while this is just one point in time, uh, if you track both through ANU poll data, which we now have going back to 2008, uh, on a three or four um, uh, waves a year, uh, the AES going back to, to 1987, uh, kind of views on the environment kind of jumped up and down, uh, but uh, have become both stable as being seen as a high priority uh, and 
views on um, new coal mines, uh, views on uh, whether enough is being done for the environment, uh, they, while they have fluctuated historically, have become pretty much entrenched as people seeing as being major issues. Uh, and unless, I mean, there's nothing to say that a conservative party couldn't own environmental issues. I mean, it's a, it can be an inherently conservative issue. You're conserving something. Uh, but uh, I, I see, I see it re I, I would see it as being very difficult for the current uh, group of coalition members, uh, and, and Jill pointed out the issue we get in new members, uh, to credibly argue that uh, they are um, able to, to tackle the environmental issues which we're struggling with. Um, so in terms of a, a realignment or, or a, or a long-term trend, uh, I think the policy issues which have mattered and are likely to continue to matter are um, going to be supportive for a the, the way the current Labor Party and, and Greens are viewed relative to the alternative. So the only way it's not going to be a realignment or a dealignment uh, is if uh, those policy issues uh, can be flipped around or at least become uh, less salient for the electorate. I think on the Greens, that's... Your point about the, of like whether the Greens are becoming mainstream and that voters aren't jumping around, and that's reflected in AES data that shows there are there are part of, there are Green partisans now, people who describe themselves as Greens, and then there'll be kids whose parents have only ever voted Green, and you grow up in a Green household, um, and that'll be a huge shift. But the, I think interesting will be where the independent voters go. Do they still see themselves as Greens or Labor, who voted tactically once? Mm. Gentlemen there? Jules, a couple of things on your trust. Yep. Uh, you have, in a, one of your things, you have trust with the, uh, in a whole series of the, uh, institutions. Yep. And you distinguish between parliament and government. But in your main one that you focus on, you talk about government. I was wondering, with, was it trust in government or was it trust in the parliament? The second question was, when you looked at the, um, you said that the Greens, no, oh, sorry, the Greens and the Independents were less trust, uh, had less trust in government still. And I, th I thought, well, maybe the nature of being an independent, whether you're a Green or, or, or other, is that you're unhappy with the system of uh, domination by the major parties. And you're still going to be concerned <coughs> about that. So you're always going to have more, you know, less trust in the system that's dominated by the parties. And even if things have got to be better, that's going to leave you still to be unhappy with the with, with, with the pub. Because wouldn't that be a, a better reason why you're getting that result than anything else? That's a really good point. I think it depends on... So I'm going to answer your second question first, Andrew, just to be annoying. I think it depends on who these voters are. And if they are... Are they... Do they have the heart and soul of an independent? Or are they partisans who are... Um, you know, temporarily kind of parking their vote with the independents. And, and that remains to be seen, right? And I think a lot of that will depend on, on how the independents act now. I'm writing, this is just top of mind because I'm writing a, a book chapter uh, separately on the independents and I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself by predicting what these independents are going to do, but I'm, but I'm slightly obsessed by it. Um, so, on that question of whether it's government or parties or parliament that we're measuring trust in, uh, I was a bit sus on this particular result, and don't worry too much about the statistics behind this, but just if you see a result to the right, a dot to the right of that um, a sort of um, slashed line, it, it means that um, it's very strongly and positively related with distrust in government, right? It's so a distrust, not sort of positive trust. Uh, and I thought, well, this is just because this is who's the government. It's the Albanese government now, right? Uh, so I ran that on parties as well, and that is political parties generally. And here, this big dot that is a massive outlier um, is very strongly related with distrust in the parties. So to that point of whether these voters are just parking their vote with an independent or whether it's something more structural, I think there's a glimmer that maybe it's more structural. And then on Parliament as well, exactly the same results. Um, 
Usually uh, we'd expect to see more differentiation between government, parliament, parties, but this is, this is a systemic kind of frustration. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that's the really open question now. Like, how, how do these independent voters move on under a majority government? Mark, you have the closing, closing uh, remark, I think. Oh, okay, thank you. Just two quick things. Um, I, um, I don't, personally, I don't think enough attention, I'm not saying enough attention here, but I mean, bro broadly speaking, has been paid yet to uh, the, the whole general appetite that voters had, particularly in these teal seats, for a new kind of politics. That uh, just to sort of, a, you know, if you think about the issues with which the uh, teal candidates were associated, they, they kept the list very short, uh, but they were, you know, women in politics, uh, climate change and addressing the corruption issue. That was essentially the three things. It was very uncluttered, in contradistinction to, say, Bill Shorten's platform in 2019, which was criticised for being far too cluttered. Um, and so I think that that's a, a strong factor. And you can, we, you know, you can look at uh, the data can, through the data at the valuing of these issues nationally. But I think in these seats. There was a, a strong articulation by people, uh, to, by, by voters, uh, to look to a new kind of politics that was actually outside of the parties. And that's probably going to be a hard thing to measure. And just a final uh, sort of, I suppose, rhetorical question in a sense, or maybe you, you want to respond to it, but is the, is the banal truth about whether this is a realignment or a dealignment, whether it's significant, is that, does it actually depend on what happens next in terms of the next election. Uh, you know, if, if, if there's a reversion to more normal voting patterns, then clearly these are unique sort of sui generis factors in this election, or, um, or, 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 or is this a sudden acceleration of a number of trends that we see going on that are reducing the major party dominance? So I might have a, just a very quick response to that, and, and that's, I can't remember who made the point, but the the power of local incumbency. Uh, so it's one thing as an independent to win a seat. Uh, it's another thing to be able to maintain a seat. Uh, and I think that's true for the Greens as well. Uh, and, and Mark, in your speech, you talked, your speech, you talked about the challenge to the Greens uh, of representing a, a diverse community. And, and I think the independents will have the same challenge. Uh, but there's also a, a real benefit there. There's a, you, you, you go to, to um, school awards nights. Uh, you go to... Uh, Citizenship I, ceremony. Yeah, you, 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 meet, you meet people, your, your face becomes known. Uh, so the ability to win back those seats, I think, is going to be far harder than it was to pr protect those seats. So while people's views might, on the thing you talked about before, about a new kind of politics, why that, while that might change and that might not be there next time, what you have against that is, in 2025 or whenever the election is, uh, is a need to convince people that they made the wrong decision uh, in voting for the independents and the Greens. And that's going to be much harder, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, back on my party identification, um, high horse but I they, these are still liberal voters in liberal seats and um, and the independents are going to have to be very conscious of that that there is a homing tendency and if they upset that compact that they will be liberal light you know they will be the nice face of tree Toryism um, the non Scott Morrison lib you know if they if they break that compact then I think you do lose that trust, right? It doesn't matter how many citizens' ceremonies and school assemblies you go to. Um, I, we still like the, ma you know, the major parties are still the, a pretty strong, you know, centrifugal force. And, the, and just very quickly, what we know about political parties is they're infinitely adaptable. So if they see a threat to their electoral position, they'll adapt to it and they'll recoup those votes. And to give you an example, in 1983, we all thought the British Labour Party was done. Their election manifesto was called the longest suicide note in history. Two elections later, you had New Labour and Tony Blair there that was then in for three subsequent elections. They adapted. 
Can everybody join me in thanking the panel? Um, so I've had the, the happy task, and um, I, as people will probably know, who've heard me speak, I can speak for a very long time about almost anything, so um, I am very conscious of time, and I will try to be as brief as I can, while also doing justice to the incredible uh, array of uh, presentations that, that we've had today. Um, I want to start by um, just emphasizing, and I guess this, this picks up on one of, of Nick's points, um, the importance of this kind of work, the importance of this longitudinal, data-driven work that gives us um, really important insights into where we are, where we think we are, the difference between where we think we are and where the da data says we are, um, but also to highlight and emphasize uh, more in perhaps hope than expectation of the value of this kind of work to politicians, to policy makers. Um, uh, you know, many of whom just sit across the lake from us. And, you know, on the one hand, it does seem to me that this, this kind of work, which goes on in all sorts of parts of, of this institution, um, you know, it's part of our national mission, we do it really, really well. <coughs> and how do we make sure that that work is influential? I mean, I think one of the, one of the, the really sort of sobering um, moments for me today was when Jill said, well, you know, we did every year, when, or whenever we did this, this work, we sent it over the lake, we told them, look at this, and nobody took any notice. Um, now, Ian's final point, that political parties can take notice when they feel really under threat, and the Labour Party of, of 1983 is a good example, shows that there is the possibility for that learning. Um, but um, how close to a crisis, how close to extinction do you need to get before you take advantage of that? Um, so there's more work for us to do here, absolutely, in terms of, of how we ensure that this great work is, is both communicated, but also, um, in some cases, undertaken with um, the, the relevant actors, whether that be political parties, the government, the parliamentary library, whoever it is. Um, because what we all want, at least what we say we want, is evidence-based policy. Um, all evidence to the contrary, very often. But um, that is what we say we want, and it does seem to me to be that. It's one of the things that this institution does really, really well, is provide excellent, independent, dispassionate uh, evidence for policy. Um, so that's the, the, the first thing to say. And, and just on that, while I, while I have the floor, um, you know, one of the ways in which we can make a difference to policy is through the way we communicate. Um, now, this is very, very unfair, um, you know, that uh, people who are not great communicators struggle very often to be heard, um, because, of course, for communication is a skill, it's a performance. Um, but you can learn in that. Um, but you also, I think it's important to recognize that there are some fantastic communicators. And we've had, uh, you know, some great examples of that here today, people who can communicate complicated data really easily. But I just want to reflect um, on, on two things, certainly on election night, when I have to say, Jill, I was one of those people who were became very emotional at the possibility that things might be different. Um, <laughs> but you know, one of, the, one of the, 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 the things that was really important for me, and that was listening to Jill on Radio National, talking about what was happening as it was happening, and knowing that she, I was listening to somebody who actually knew what she was talking about. Um, so we have the great privilege of, of having people here like Jill, like Mark, um, who are able to both uh, do research, but also understand and interpret for us what it means. So enough about that. Um, just a couple of things that I want to um, reflect on, and then I want to give you um, some challenges uh, to perhaps um, counter some of the, uh, um, the optimism that may be prevailing. Um, so in terms of, of the, the political parties and trends, I'm not going to try not to repeat things that people have said, but it does seem to me that there are some, some interesting um, things that we might start to, to think about in terms of, of how politics might be different, if it will be different at all. Um, and I was really struck by Ian's uh, analysis of leaders um, and just how unpopular they've become, but also how important they've become. Um, and it's one of the things that you know, has, has happened across um, a range of advanced uh, liberal democracies, that the idea of the leader, that the person of the leader has become much more important than actually it really should be uh, in terms of the way in which the, the democratic system is constructed. Uh, but nonetheless, here we are. 
Um, and I think my question in relation to that is, if, if the personality of the leader is so important, then how would Australia react now to the possibility of a new female leader? Would a new female leader have a better chance of succeeding in Australia now than Julia Gillard did? Um, would it be possible for somebody like Julia Gillard to now step into a leadership role in the way that it wasn't only three or four years ago? So I think there's something really interesting there about if we, if we accept that leadership matters, uh, are we accepting of a particular kind of leadership or, or is the door open now uh, to a different kind of, of a leader, a, a leader like somebody like Julia Gillard or indeed Julie Bishop? Um, and that then, of course, brings me on to the, the question of women and depending on where you were in this session, you know, it either doesn't make any difference at all or it makes all the difference in the world and that's what you love about data and research. Um, but for me, I think what's important is the extent to which that group of crossbenchers plus um, all of the women in the, in the major parties, to what extent are they actually going to change practice in Parliament? Because that's what so many people want. That's what we say we want. We look at the way the Parliament works and we are discussing. <coughs> um, now, will, will women be able to make that difference? Shouldn't be down to women. We all know that. We can have that argument. Uh, but in fact, it very often is. So is the fact of the sheer representation by numbers of women in the Parliament now going to change the way in which uh, Parliament operates? And will it, heaven forfend, change the way in which the Liberal Party approaches women? Will the Liberal Party start thinking about quotas in the way that the Labour Party have to? Um, so, I, you know, again, not much evidence from, from Mark's assessment early on um, of, of how the, the Liberals are approaching this, but that does seem to me to be one of the stark questions for them. Um, the Greens, everybody's talked about, so I won't say anything more about them. Um, I do want to come back to this, this point about the future, though, and... Um, you know, the, the wonderful, uh, in his wonderful presentation on young people. Um, but you know, I do have a concern that this idea that somehow the generation, the, the progressive generations will just simply wipe out, um, you know, moves to, the, moves to the right, which I know isn't what it is saying, but it is one of the logical consequences of, of that kind of analysis. Um, I do worry about that, and Chris very kindly showed me a, an article that he'd written uh, which points to the way in which, uh, as he put it, when people get a mortgage, they suddenly discover uh, conservative values. Um, so I do think there's something really important there, and I'm going to come back to why in a, in a moment. Um, what does all this mean potentially for policy? Well, um, and, and trust is something that, that I think uh, underpins all of what I'll be um, talking about from here on in. So thank you, Jill, for... Uh, for raising that, um, and also thank you, Andrew, for raising the possibility that actually a healthy amount of distrust in our government systems is quite good for us all, because uh, there's nothing worse than blind trust. Um, so what, what might all of this mean for policy? Well, I think there's a big question, and, and, and I think Marion was on her way to raising it, about what, what might all of this mean for policy around equality? We can call it women's policy if we like, but you know that doesn't, that doesn't quite do it, because it shouldn't be policy. That's just the, the concern of women. But are we now in a, in a state where we can have a much more sensible and practical conversation about the way in which the tax system works and how it disadvantages uh, parents with kids, women in particular, the way in which um, our sexual harassment, our family violence policies are, uh, are completely dysfunctional? Um, are there, is there the space now to have those kinds of policy discussions in a, in a meaningful way? There should be. Um, there, but but um, it, it, it remains to be to be seen whether that is the case. And I, as I say, I'm very dis uncomfortable with the idea of a sort of women's policy thing because I just think it brackets stuff off. But nonetheless, this is how we tend to talk about these things. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, to raise before I come on to some uh, uh, questions of, of, about what's next, um, I think there's a couple of things to say. Firstly, Mark started by talking about Whitlam and his visit to China and the ways in which, if you take a, you know, a historical perspective on these things, our relationship with China as a country, particularly in terms of economics and trade, you know, that relationship built up over a long period of time and served Australia very, very, very well. So um, you know, any commitments, any, any sort of um, 
predictions anybody makes about policy in the short term, I think need to be seen in the context that um, you know, the benefits of good decisions can last a very, very long time. Um, and when was the last time government made a good decision in terms of policy? Can't think of one. Lots of terrible, terrible decisions that governments have made. Um, but uh, there is something here that I think just to simply expect the policy that has been poor for such a long time will, just because we've had a change of government, suddenly, suddenly become better. Um, is, is rather mistaken, and I think that comes to uh, a point that both Andrew and I agree on about the state of the public service that um, needs to be addressed, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So, no question, you know, Nick and, and the data has given us some very clear indications of what people care about and what, why they might change their vote. My concern is, do we actually have uh, the policy capability and capacity? We might have the capability, very, very smart people in the public service, do we have the capacity in the system to enact the kind of policy uh, that will be needed to sustain us over a long period of time? Um, and I say that because, as I said, the, the, there's, there's just some, not quite cold water, but cold-ish water that I'd like to dump on the gathering at this point. Um, and that is, you know, there seems to be a reasonable amount of, um, of optimism, at least in, in terms of the data and what, what it's telling us. Um, if, if that is that you uh, see these things as, as predictors of positive change. Um, but um, there's a couple of things I think that are important to note. Uh, the first one is that any enthusiasm that anybody has for change in the practice of politics in Parliament needs to be met with the sober assessment of what happens in institutions over time. So that group of people, not all women, but many women who have never been in Parliament before, are going to go into a Parliament uh, with huge expectations of what they might be able to do, and they're going to come up with a set of, against a set of institutions, rules, conventions, ways of doing things that will be completely alien to them, and are not subject to easy reform and change. That's why they're institutions, they're enduring, they're long-lasting. So one of the, the things that hasn't come up, but I would like to, to raise in this, is, is not whether these independents, teal or otherwise, will hold on to their seats because they are, um, because of the nature of, of the electorate. But rather, whether these independents will take one look at Parliament and think, don't want to borrow this. Really don't want to borrow this. So we have to think about the actors in the system as well as the, um, what the electorate's thinking. And I think that that's really important and we haven't considered it enough. How do we get that institution to change? And we cannot just put it all on the shoulders of um, a small number of people who are not familiar with the rules of the game. The second thing is that um, Australia, as we, you know, Josh Wright wrote, was very keen to tell us was in uh, was that was not in recession for 32 years or something, very long time. As that is remarkable. It's incredible. But that means. An awful lot of those voters that we've talked about today have only ever voted in an environment of economic growth and stability. Even the global financial crisis, you know, the first time I came to Australia 10 years ago, I mentioned the global financial crisis, I was told in no uncertain terms it was not a global crisis because it didn't happen in Australia. So I think there's, there's something here for me um, which is about the crisis to come. Uh, the pandemic has been uh, really revealing, and it's fascinating that Ian's data tells us that they actually told us some good things about social cohesion. But the instability in the world, the impact that we're currently feeling just in terms of energy uh, crisis, for example, all of these things are shocks to the system that, that the system has not had for a very long time. And a bunch of people voting have never experienced this. So what's that going to do if the crisis does emerge? What is that going to do? to people's perceptions of what is possible in terms of elections. Um, and we just don't, we don't know that, but I think it's, a, it's an important thing to explore. Because not least at the, this very moment, you have a new government that is faced with extraordinary challenges. Um, so however much progressive policymakers might want all sorts of things to happen, reform of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is absolutely essential, um, However much people want those things to happen, uh, the Uru um, statement from the heart, the voice to parliament, crucial. But 
how much space is there, at least in the short term, uh, for a government to deal with these things when it is actually coming up against a huge problem of the budget. So I think there's, a, there's a, a, some cold water realism that we need to um, dump on some of the uh, enthusiasm that some of the commentators that Jill was talking about have expressed. And I, I don't mean to be um, depressing about this, I just think it is a reality that this government is facing extraordinary challenges. Um, and you know, both the independents and indeed the electorate may find that quite difficult to deal with. Um, and the third thing that I, I want to throw in as something that we haven't really thought about, as we didn't need to in, in, in the data, is, is what's happening in what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution, the way in which everything that we do, how we work, how we engage with each other, and, and we in universities have seen this in the context of the pandemic when we've all had to become experts in digital technology. Um, what is, what is this all going to mean? We are living through this at the moment. Things are changing very, 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 very quickly. Governments are always on the back foot, particularly in terms of regulation. So what is that going to mean for the, the capacity of not just this government, but any government to effectively govern uh, when it is uh, constantly uh, behind? So I think there's some cautionary notes to, um, to to sound in the context of, of this great um, data, but it's, it's wonderful that we, we have this analysis. Um, I think the other messages from the, uh, from the presentations are really that you need to pay attention to the local um, in a way that perhaps we haven't um, in the past. Um, integrity is absolutely key, and um, that is something that the public have decided that they do care about and uh, there needs to be reform. And that we need to think much more collaboratively and, and as a and practice cooperation than we have in the past. And I think that this is one of the risks for the Labour government, is that now they have a majority and they think they don't need to collaborate. Um, I think they could end up in trouble very, very quickly. But the issue of collaboration goes far beyond just the, the, the government and the parliament. It goes through our public service, it goes through um, the, the states and the and local government, without cooperation on policy and delivery, um, you are not going to see the kind of change that um, the public quite rightly expects. And I think I probably talked for long enough, so I'll stop there. Thank you all very much. Um, so, look, that's it for us. Uh, thanks everyone for, oh, take my mask off. Thanks everyone for coming along. Thanks for everyone's questions. Uh, and. Uh, as mentioned, we're going to make the, the video available um, and uh, Darren Penne, who uh, got stuck in Melbourne, uh, has, in, in his spare time, maybe at the Qantas Lounge, uh, put together a video presentation as well. One of the things we didn't talk about, which Darren was going to focus on, uh, was how, how the polls went. Uh, and so that's part of that video presentation. Um, so that's it for us. Thanks, everyone. Uh, enjoy your Friday. Enjoy your weekend. See you later.